can see the desperation in the journey simply by looking at the trail that's left behind. So she says she's 17. She looks kind of like she's 12. She said to me, you know, if you tried to do this in New York City, take a picture of a man, he'd break your camera. There's something very, very uncomfortable about this. Today, a white supremacist lens. This area can be the new Silicon Valley. There was not a cot in the warehouse, not one cot in the warehouse. We're so far deep at this point, there's no turning back. This is a long road ahead. Ah! Telling the whole story means going where the story is. How did you get rescued? Listening when people are hurting. Sorry. Getting to the heart of what matters. Wow. That's who Nora is. That's what Nora does. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell from Washington, D.C. Good morning to you and welcome to CBS This Morning. Understanding the world. We're going to begin with breaking news. Begins with the right questions. Have police discovered a motive? Does the president have a red line here? What can voters are expect to see today? Join Gail King, Anthony Mason, and Tony DeCopel on CBS This Morning. We know a little more this morning. This is a major development. This is a very serious situation. More news every morning on the show everyone is talking about. We have much more news ahead for you. CBS This Morning. Biggest names in politics. Whoa, that's news. Are we at a tipping point? Face the questions you want answered. Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan. In Russia, a man was arrested for allegedly shooting and killing five people. The incident happened in the village of Yalatma. The arrest was made after the man complained to his neighbors from his balcony, asking them to quiet down. The neighbors began to argue with the man who then shot them with his hunting rifle. The village is on lockdown due to the coronavirus. Turkey is lifting a confinement order for young workers that was imposed during the coronavirus pandemic. The exemption applies to public and private sector employees, as well as seasonal agricultural workers between the ages of 18 and 20 years old. It comes after President Erdogan issued a mandatory curfew for all people under 20 on Friday. It was in addition to a stay-at-home order already in place for people over age 65. There are at least 25,000 confirmed cases of the virus across Turkey. Nearly 600 people have died. The UN Secretary General has called for an end to domestic violence after noting a horrifying global surge in cases. In some countries, the number of women calling support services has doubled. Meanwhile, health care providers and police are overwhelmed and understaffed. Local support groups are paralyzed or short of funds. Some domestic violence shelters are closed, others are full. I urge all governments to make the campaign. Antonio Gutierrez urged all governments to include the prevention of violence against women in their national response plans for COVID-19. He also suggests shelters be declared essential services and leaders ensure abusers continue to be prosecuted during the pandemic. There's no official data showing the coronavirus death toll by demographic, but the pandemic appears to be disproportionately affecting people of color in some communities. Here's Jerika Duncan with more. You know, we're in the middle of the storm right now. We need as much data as possible. Right now we're flying blind. Milwaukee Health Commissioner Jeanette Kowalik is overseeing roughly a million residents in Milwaukee County. Of the 40 people who have died so far because of the coronavirus in your county, what percentage of those people are Black? Right now, it's still about 80%. African Americans make up 26% of the population? Correct. Right now, the CDC is not collecting data on the race of those who've tested positive or died from coronavirus. 
makes it important right. to actually document the race of the people who are infected and dying. Everyone will be affected by this, but there are some communities and populations that are going to be affected even more significantly. Dr. Uche Blackstock is founder and CEO of Advancing Health Equity in New York City. The reason why we need to really discuss this issue and to collect the racial and ethnic demographic data on who is tested, who has the disease, and on who's dying from it is so that we can properly allocate uh, healthcare resources equitably to the communities that need it. Dr. Blackstock also works part-time at urgent care facilities in Brooklyn. Can you describe the makeup of the people in your waiting room right now? We're noticing more black and brown and immigrant patients that are seeking care. And a lot of these patients are um, essential workers. Uh, a lot of them are service workers. She says testing is still not readily available. How many COVID-19 tests are you all able to give each day? We are instructed that you know, we probably should not uh, test more than one in 10 patients. So 10%, exactly. no more than 10% of the people that come through there every day. Our criteria is really we're focusing on the highest risk patients. CBS News contributor Ibram X. Kendi is also director of the Anti-Racist Policy Center at American University. If we don't have an awareness right now of racial disparities, we can't right now figure out what's causing those racial disparities what policies or even lack thereof, then we can't change it right now in the moment when people are dying and, and being infected. And according to a new report by WBEZ Public Radio in Chicago, an analysis of county data showed that 70% of the people who died from coronavirus in Chicago are Black. Jerika Duncan, CBS News, New York. A four-year-old female tiger at New York City's Bronx Zoo has tested positive for the coronavirus. Officials say Nadia first began showing signs of the virus on March 27th after developing a dry cough. They say the tiger was exposed to an asymptomatic worker at the zoo. Six other large cats are also showing symptoms, but they are all expected to be okay. Authorities believe it is the first confirmed COVID-19 infection of a tiger in the U.S. Brian Larson joins me now. He's a registered nurse and CEO of Restore a Pet, a health supplement company for pets. Hi, Brian. Thanks so much for joining us. So can humans get coronavirus from animals? Yeah, so there's currently no evidence whatsoever that humans can get COVID-19, the current coronavirus, from animals. We are seeing these rare instances of animals, uh, pets getting coronavirus from humans, but ultimately we believe that this is really a minimal risk and we believe that some basic steps, uh, some precautions are going to be able to protect against this. And so if your pet is showing symptoms of, you know, respiratory distress or other symptoms as this tiger at the Bronx Zoo was showing, should you try to get your pet your pet tested for COVID-19? Yeah, so routine COVID-19 testing among pets is really not something that's occurring. And again, it's very, very unlikely that if a pet was demonstrating some upper respiratory symptoms, that that would be due to COVID-19. Um, we have seen instances of cats being infected with COVID-19 in the lab, and they were ultimately asymptomatic. And there have been two dogs that have been known to test a week positive for coronavirus. Uh, those dogs also were asymptomatic. Ferrets, as a sort of unique group that are sometimes household pets, can demonstrate a fever and a cough and can be infected with COVID-19. But they're sort of something of an outlier at this point. Uh, and don't scientists believe, though, that this particular virus, this particular coronavirus, originated with animals? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. So coronaviruses are unique in the fact that they have a little protein spike that ultimately is able to attach to certain cells. And that little protein um, is, is rapidly mutating. And ultimately, that protein was able to, we believe, go from a bat to ultimately infect a human. And that, that ACE2 protein, that protein is common among a number of pets. So that's part of the reason why you're seeing this get 
ultimately adopted in some pets and those pets being infected, um, but those pets are not symptomatic and it's not believed that they can transmit the disease back to humans. But yes, that is what is so dangerous about COVID-19 is the fact that it is able to rapidly evolve and mutate. And so if you happen to be unlucky enough to you know, become infected with this virus, you're quarantining yourself, should you also quarantine yourself from your pet? Could your pet then you know, carry some of the virus on his or her fur to other family members in your house? Absolutely. So, I mean, the, the, we know that the coronavirus ultimately is able to survive on surfaces for hours to days. And if nothing else proves to be true, we know that a pet's skin and fur is ultimately a surface that can theoretically harbor COVID-19. So if a person is infected with COVID-19 or believes they may be infected, then in the same way that they really should be quarantining from other human members of the family, they should be quarantining from their pets. And that might include having someone else provide care for the pet, if at all possible. If that's not possible, then the same precautions that would be true for human-to-human -human transfer risk, uh, meaning proper hand hygiene being critical, needs to also be observed with the pet. So that means washing your hands thoroughly for at least 20 seconds, providing the necessary care, and then washing your hands again for 20 seconds before and after contact. It is such a bitter pill for a lot of quarantine people to swallow. I mean, if, if they've gotten themselves shut off from the rest of their family in a basement or a room, to then not be able to get derive some comfort from the family pet on top of that, it must be so difficult. But you say with precautions, you can sort of share the pet among household members as long as you're very, very careful about it. That's right. I mean, pets are full-fledged members of the family, right? We all hopefully believe that. And so ultimately, these basic precautions and this limited duration of time by which we need to observe these very stringent precautions will ultimately ensure that we're all living long, healthy lives, enjoying our pets and the other members of our family. So I'm just curious because we know that the COVID-19 test for humans is often very uncomfortable. Is it the same test when uh, you're testing an animal for this virus? Yeah, so it really depends on the animal. Um, ultimately, it is a nasal swab. Uh, they can also do oral and rectal swabs as they did in the canine examples of COVID-19. But when you think about, for example, the tiger at the Bronx Zoo, as you mentioned, there are now multiple animals that are showing symptoms of COVID-19. Because it was a tiger, they ultimately had to put that tiger under general anesthesia. And that's precisely the reason why they're not testing the rest of the animals uh, that are displaying those symptoms. They believe that they are a presumptive positive. But yes, in this case, it's a nasal swab that they're doing. And, uh, but, but you know, there's, there's uh, certainly a very uncomfortable procedure associated with that and risks, hence why they needed the general anesthesia. All right. Interesting story. Brian Larson of Restora Pet, thank you so much for sharing your expertise on this with us. Thank you so much. Apple is making face shields for medical workers and has sourced over 20 million masks through its supply chain. The company's CEO, Tim Cook, made the announcement on Twitter Sunday. He said the first shipment of shields was given to a hospital in Santa Clara, California last week. Cook said they are adjustable and can be assembled in less than two minutes. Apple plans to ship over a million by the end of this week and a million weekly after that. The company intends to expand its distribution of supplies beyond the U.S. Many Hollywood studios are changing the way they do business because of the pandemic. Chris Martinez takes a look at what this means for audiences and the box office. As movie theaters across the U.S. shut their doors, studios in Hollywood were left scrambling to make a new plan. The solution for many, bypass the box office and head straight for the small screen. Take, for instance, Trolls World Tour. The animated musical originally slated for a theatrical release on April 10th will now instead get a digital release on that same date. And other movies that were in theaters as the pandemic took off are now getting early digital debuts. 
I'm Sonic. Sonic the Hedgehog, which arrived in theaters in mid-February, has already had a home release. I know that for people who are shot inside, it's been a lifesaver. Variety Magazine's Matt Donnelly says movie studios are having to rethink how to reach audiences and make money, which could have a lasting effect. He thinks home release could become the new normal for many mid-budget movies. So if you're looking at a film that, that costs anywhere between 30 and, and $100 million that might not be about superheroes or cars that fly off of the Eiffel Tower, um, you can probably see those a lot, a lot more of those going straight to, to streaming platforms. But not every movie is getting the streaming treatment. Many studios are taking their big titles out of the mix entirely, choosing instead to shuffle their release schedules. Some of those, like Marvel's Black Widow, have been postponed by a matter of months, with others, like the latest Fast and Furious, being pushed to next year. Donnelly says these would-be blockbusters need months in the theaters globally to reach their full financial potential. So these are really strategic business decisions. Um, and also, I think in the long term, will be good for the health of the movie business. That strategy proving one way or another, the show must go on. Chris Martinez, CBS News, Los Angeles. And we're going to take a quick break now, but when we return, the latest on the coronavirus pandemic and how the White House is racing to contain the outbreak in the United States as the number of infections skyrockets. This is CBSN. We'll be right back. Watch CBSN 24 7. We've got an amazing story to share with you. Let's talk about the latest developments. There's so many levels to this. We have a CBS News exclusive. Fires in California. What happens next and how does it all play out? We are on a mission with NASA. I understand you have some breaking news. It's not over yet, is the bottom line. This is a massive operation. It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. Telling the whole story means going where the story is. How did you get rescued? Listening when people are hurting. Sorry. Getting to the heart of what matters. Wow. That's who Nora is. That's what Nora does. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell from Washington, D.C. This is CBSN. Thanks for joining us. I'm Paula Evan. The doctors leading the nation's coronavirus response are warning this could be the worst week yet. More than 337,000 cases of coronavirus have been reported in the U.S., more cases than Italy and Spain combined. And now more than 10,000 Americans have died. Elise Preston begins our team coverage from New York City, the nation's pandemic epicenter. Inside this Brooklyn hospital, 80% of the patients here are being treated for COVID-19, some requiring intubation the second they arrive. Doctors say this man in his early 50s had no underlying conditions and is requiring 100% oxygen to keep his lungs inflated. Old people, young people, people are dying from this. It, it is lethal. The hospital staff is not immune and in some cases not fully protected. We saw nurses wearing trash bags to protect their scrubs, use sanitizing wipes to clean themselves as they work, and a doctor wearing ski goggles. New York's governor says this state may be close to reaching its apex or may have already reached a plateau, but it is just the beginning for other states. Louisiana is expected to open a 1,000 bed makeshift hospital inside the New Orleans Convention Center a day after the state experienced its largest single day uptick in deaths. Texas officials are now stopping people coming in from Louisiana, asking for documentation on where they're going and if they're staying, they must self quarantine for 14 days. And in Largo, Maryland, the community is mourning 27 year old Leilani Jordan, a grocery store employee. Her mother took these photos of her daughter's hospital room before she passed away. When they got her, she had 104 fever. And they put her in isolation and she said, she called me. She says, Mommy, I can barely breathe. Jordan's mother says instead of leaving work when the outbreak began, she only wanted to help people more. 
Elise Preston, CBS News, New York. The stock market began the week on a positive note. The Dow jumped more than 900 points after the opening bell. Right now, it is up 1,200 points. Investor confidence seemingly high today after some encouraging coronavirus data that shows a slowdown in infections. A new government report says that hospitals are overwhelmed with patients and running out of supplies. And it's not just masks and ventilators. Skylar Henry has more details from the White House. Americans are preparing for what health officials say will be a particularly deadly week in the coronavirus pandemic. The next week is going to be our Pearl Harbor moment. It's going to be our 9-11 moment. Uh, it's going to be the hardest moment for many Americans in their entire lives. President Trump says he thinks doctors should use the drug hydroxychloroquine to treat patients who've tested positive. You have to go through uh, your medical people, get the approval, uh, but... Uh, I've seen things that I sort of like, so what do I know? I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor, but I have common sense. But the doctors leading the coronavirus task force are advising people to slow down. There have been cases that show there may be an effect, and there are others to show there's no effect. So I think in terms of science, I don't think we could definitively say it works. A new report from the Department of Health and Human Services Inspector General says hospitals across the country face dire shortages of the medical equipment needed to combat the pandemic. The report says it's not just masks and ventilators that are in short supply, it's also thermometers, disinfectants, cleaning supplies, and toilet paper. The president says the government is sending gloves, gowns, and masks to hospitals. Many more fully loaded cargo planes are right now on the way. Three big ones landed today. And these supplies are being distributed directly to the hospitals and health care providers all across the nation. But the report says many of the supplies already delivered were out of date or defective. And it adds hospitals reported that changing and sometimes inconsistent guidance from federal, state, and local authorities posed challenges and confused hospitals and the public. Skyler Henry, CBS News, the White House. Two New York companies are teaming up to alleviate the medical supply shortage. Fashion brand Lafayette 148 and military gear manufacturer Cry Precision are working together to make reusable surgical gowns. This creativity and this ingenuity are New York traits. It's not surprising to us as New Yorkers to see this kind of thing happen. But it's very moving. It's very beautiful to see it go through all those rows upon rows of sewing machines and seeing the surgical gowns being sewn that very soon will be protecting our frontline health care workers. Mayor de Blasio says the new production efforts are expected to provide 9,200 reusable gowns ready by the end of the day, 19,000 by the end of this week, and a total of 320,000 by the end of April. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo says that the rate of new infections is slowing, but that the health care system is still being pushed at an unsustainable rate. And the engine is at red line. And you can't go any faster. And by the way, you can't stay at red line for any period of time because the system will blow. And that's where we are. We are at red line. People can't work any harder. The staff can't uh, work any harder. And staying at this level is problematic. The governor adds that the slowing of cases could mean that the state is reaching a plateau or beginning to flatten the curve. The Navy captain who was fired after issuing a warning about coronavirus on board an aircraft carrier is now infected with the virus himself. This news comes as the defense secretary doubles down on the decision to dismiss him. Laura Podesta of CBS News has the details. Uh, from the beginning. In TV interviews over the weekend, Defense Secretary Mark Esper explained the decision behind firing Captain Brett Crozier. Crozier wrote this now famous letter complaining the Navy was not acting fast enough to get his crew off the USS Theodore Roosevelt and into isolation after dozens of sailors contracted the coronavirus. Over half of the ship has been tested. Only 155 sailors uh, have come up uh, positive. Uh, those are all mild and moderate. There have been no hospitalizations whatsoever. So uh, the, the, the crew is being taken care of out there. Uh, with regard to the relief of Captain Crozier, I think uh, Acting Secretary Modley uh, made a, a very tough decision. 
uh, decision uh, that I support. It was based on his view that he had lost faith and confidence in the captain based on his actions. President Trump during a briefing Saturday said Crozier's firing was connected to the letter which was leaked to the press and also a recent stop the aircraft carrier made in Vietnam. A lot of people got off the boat. They came back and they had infection. And I thought it was inappropriate for the captain of a ship to do I want to I don't want to comment as to whether or not, but I agree with their decision 100%. The captain seems to have the full backing of his crew. Sailors chanted his name as he left the ship late last week. Esper said there's an ongoing Hi, everyone. I'm Elaine Quijano. Straight to the White House briefing room right now and President Trump. Let's listen in. As we enter a crucial and difficult phase of the battle, we continue to send our prayers to the people of New York and New Jersey and to our whole country. But right now, New York and New Jersey are very hot zones, and uh, we're with them, we're with everybody. Your struggle is our struggle, and uh, we will beat this virus. We will beat it together. I also want to send best wishes to a very good friend of mine and a friend to our nation, Prime Minister Boris Johnson. We're very saddened to hear that he was taken into intensive care this afternoon, a little while ago. And uh, Americans are all praying for his recovery. He's been a really good friend. He's been really something very special, strong, resolute, doesn't quit, doesn't give up. Uh, we have made tremendous progress on therapeutics. I had a fantastic call today, which I'll be talking about a little bit later. And I've asked two of the leading companies, these are brilliant companies, uh, Ebola, AIDS, others, they've come with the solutions and uh, just have done incredible jobs. And I've asked them to contact London immediately. They have offices in London and major companies, but more than major, more than size, they're genius. And uh, I had a talk with four of them today, and they speak a language that most people don't even understand. But I understand something, that they've really advanced therapeutics and therapeutically, and uh, they have arrived in London already. Their London office has whatever they need, and we'll see if we can be of help. We've contacted uh, all of Boris's doctors, and uh, we'll see what is going to take place. But they are ready to go. But when you get brought into intensive care, that gets very, very serious with this particular disease. So. Uh, the two companies are there and uh, with what they are talking about, and it's uh, rather complex and, and has had really incredible results. Uh, we're working with the FDA and everybody else, but we are working with London with respect to Boris Johnson. Across the country, we're attacking the enemy on all fronts, including medical, scientific, social logistical and economic. We're pressing into action the full power of American government and American enterprise. And our military has been incredible. We've just sent 3,000 uh, public health personnel. They're now deployed in the New York area, and they'll be over at the Javits Center, over at the, the Great Ship. And uh, as you probably have heard, uh, and I was informed that Governor Cuomo is already uh, told you and announced. He called me up a little while ago and he asked whether or not it would be possible to use the ship uh, with respect to fighting the virus. And we hadn't had that in mind at all, but we're going to let him do it. And we're also going to let New Jersey, uh, Governor Murphy, we spoke with him a little while ago, and uh, New Jersey is going to use it also because New Jersey is a hot, a hot spot. So Governor Murphy and Governor Cuomo are going to be using the ship, New York, New Jersey, and uh, it's a big ship. And it's now COVID. It's set for COVID. And we are going to, hopefully, uh, that will be uh, very helpful to both states. Uh, the Javits Center, which is 2,900 beds just built by our military, also is going to be manned now by the military, and they should be in place tomorrow. 
and they'll start sending quite a few people over to the Javits Center. It's convenient. It's right in the middle of everything. So that'll be something great. And uh, we appreciated Governor Cuomo's nice, really nice statements. And likewise, Governor Murphy, we have uh, worked very well with both of them and with, frankly, all of the governors. Uh, Vice President Pence had a call this morning with them that lasted for close to two hours. And I understand there wasn't a, uh, a negative person on the call, 50 governors or just about 50 governors. I think they were all on from what I understood. And uh, they were very positive about everything uh, their federal government has been doing for them. And you'll hear what that is, and it's, it's rather amazing, actually. Uh, nationwide, the Army Corps of Engineers is building 22 field hospitals. These are big hospitals and alternate care sites in 18 states. So you have a combination of 22 field hospitals. In addition to that, we're building alternate care sites, which is a little bit of a smaller version of the hospital. And uh, we have a lot of them, and they're going up in 18 different states. In total, we have deployed 8,450 hospital beds from federal stockpiles. And, you know, if you think this is done over a period of really a period of weeks. It's incredible, actually. More than 8,000 ventilators have been sent from the national stockpile to our cities and states, backed by the Defense Production Act, which we've used very strongly, very powerfully. So powerfully that we don't have to use it too much, frankly. And it's nice when you don't have to. We're getting more than we ever bargained for. American industry is stepping up. Manufacturers are really going to town. And we have thousands of ventilators being built uh, as we speak, and we have hundreds that are being sent to different locations, and we're ready to roll with almost 10,000 that we have in the federal stockpile. Uh, when I say ready to roll, too, I mean uh, exactly what that uh, states. We are, wherever that monster goes, we're able to move with it. Great flexibility. We have tremendous flexibility, and we have people waiting, and they're ready, willing, and able, but waiting to bring them wherever it may be, if they need it, if they need it. Uh, it's possible that they won't be needed, that we're fully stocked, because uh, numbers are coming in where, because of what the American people are doing, uh, we're having fewer hospital visits. I think that could be the case in New York. It could be the case in a few other states. And fewer beds, fewer hospital visits mean fewer ventilators. So we'll see uh, whether or not our original projections were right. But anyway, I had a very good talk with uh, both governors, and I think they're very happy, extremely happy about the uh, what we're doing for them, and especially going all COVID. So that'll take place uh, almost immediately. FEMA and HHS have directly distributed 11.7 million N95 respirators. Think of that. Get the number. 11.7 million N95 respirators. 11.7 million. 26.5 million surgical masks. 5.3 million face shields. 4.4 million surgical gowns. And 22.6 million gloves. 22.6 million gloves. We have also arranged for vast quantities of additional materials to be allocated through donations and existing supply chains. We've also given tremendous medical material and supplies throughout the 50 states and territories. And through Project Airbridge, we have succeeded in bringing plane loads of vital supplies into the United States from overseas. Uh, we had an additional three — these are massive planes, by the way. Uh, the big planes are very big very powerful, and they're loaded to the gills with supplies. And rather than bringing them into our stockpile, as we've discussed, we bring them to all the different locations where they're needed so we can save a big step and a timely step. Because of my actions under the DPA, I can also announce today that we have reached an agreement, very amicable agreement, with 3M for the delivery of an additional 55.5 million high-quality face masks, face masks each month. 
so that we're going to be getting, over the next couple of months, 166.5 million masks for our frontline healthcare workers. So the 3M saga ends very happily. Uh, we're very proud to be dealing now with 3M and its uh, CEO, Mike Roman. I just spoke with him and I thanked him for getting it done. And uh, Mike was very happy to get it done. Great company. So we're getting 166.5 million masks, and mostly that's going to be for our frontline healthcare workers. Okay, that's 3M. Thank you, 3M. I also want to thank Apple, one of the many great American companies that's taken into, that's really leapt into action. Today, Apple announced that it is now producing plastic face shields for healthcare workers at the rate of 1 million per week. One million, and these are the shields that you see on television quite a bit, and they're at the highest level of quality and safety. Uh, we're grateful as well to Salesforce, which has donated 48 million pieces of personal protective equipment, including masks, gowns, suits, and face shields. So thank you very much to Salesforce. I urge all of our nation's governors to ensure that the massive deliveries that we've made to your states over the past few weeks are distributed as quickly as possible. So again, we're working very well with the governors. Now, they may see you and say, oh, we're not happy. But they're very happy on the phone. And Mike Pence is a straight shooter, and he had a great phone conversation to them with all of the governors, teleconference. And uh, they're very happy, every one of them. Were there any negatives? No, sir. See? I told you. Mike is the greatest. Mike, and you have done a great job, Mike, and I appreciate it. The whole country appreciates it. Anthony appreciates it, right? Don't you see? Everybody appreciates Mike, special man. So uh, a lot of the things that we've done, again, are going directly to the states. The states seem to be very happy. If they're not, they can call me directly. They can call Mike directly and we'll make them happy. But tremendous progress has been made in a very short period. And I think, very importantly, uh, the progress has been made before the surge comes, because the next week, week and a half, is going to be a big surge, the professionals tell us. And I think we're in uh, good shape for it, Anthony, so it's good timing, really good timing. We can have this stuff there. It's already there for the most part, but we're bringing a lot of uh, different resources to, uh, to the various locations, especially where the surge is looking like it's going to take place. Resources from the national stockpile need to reach our warriors. And they are warriors. I tell it all the time. I saw it again this morning. These young, in many cases, many cases older, but they're walking into the hospital and they're putting on gas. I mean, as their door is open, they're going into this place. And, you know, it's not exactly too safe. And they're going in there, and they're putting the outfits on, and they're putting their masks on, and they're — it's incredible. It's no — it's really — it's, like, no different than you watch the war movies, or you watch the old clips of war running up hills. It's, it, to me, it's the same thing. Men and women, young and old, but a lot of young people just going in there. They're not thinking about, oh, gee, this is dangerous. They're not saying, oh, I don't want to go in. They're, they're warriors. They're running through those doors. It's the most incredible thing. It's, it's a beautiful, it's an incredible, beautiful thing. Resources from the National Stockpile need to reach these warriors in the hospitals immediately, and we're making sure they do. And again, the states have that responsibility, but we're working with the states, and we're getting the states a lot of things that they could distribute, or when they tell us, we bring it directly to the hospital from the federal stockpile or from the planes that land which, without even going to the stockpile. If any state's having difficulty distributing supplies, we urge you to use the National Guard to assist in the delivery. And I have to say, you have done a fantastic job. Deborah, you know that you've done great. Tony, you know that you've done great. But what a job you've done, and I appreciate it. I really do. Your whole group has been incredible. That's a lot of stars you have, I'll tell you that. He's supposed to do a great job when you have four stars, right? But the uh, military has been incredible, and I thank them for all of us.
Conversely, if a state believes that it has surplus equipment or supplies, very important because we actually have gotten so much to some of the states that they're able to now — they've done a fantastic job, and they've kept — they've kept that line low. And uh, we have some states that have surplus equipment and supplies, and they're working with us to rapidly redeploy those supplies to areas of greatest need. We thought that might happen. If it worked out well, that's what was going to happen, and it's happening. And I want to thank Governor Gavin Newsom, who's doing a tremendous job, who's announced California will send 500 ventilators to be distributed to other locations. I think some are going to Arizona. Some are going to Washington, D.C. We think they're going to Delaware. We're working with that. But uh, 500 excess ventilators from the state of California, and uh, we're going to get them taken care of wherever they have to go. Those decisions are being made right now. Uh, the members of the White House Task Force and I are in close touch with mayors and governors and hospital administrators across our country. And we're told that the present time — at the present time, most of the critical needs are — are being more than met. States have to continue sharing detailed information in the amount and utilization rates of medical supplies so we know what to resupply them. Or they can get it directly. That includes ventilators. They can get it directly. Ideally, if they can get it directly. But if they can't, if they're unable to do it, we have uh, tremendous amounts of supplies, and we're building it up very fast, too. And this is before the big surge. This information is fundamental to our ability to deliver the material when — when and where it's most needed. Uh, now, Mike, in his conversation today, I think uh, got some information as to a couple of locations where we're going to be delivering large numbers of ventilators and large numbers of uh, medical supplies, and we'll take care of that. Uh, but some of the states are uh, very happy. Even Governor Pritzker from Illinois is happy. Of course, he may not be happy when he talks to the press, but he's happy. He's a very happy man. We're increasingly hopeful that the aggressive mitigation strategy we put into place will ultimately allow our hospital system to successfully manage the major influx of cases that — that we have right now. I, again, I, I say that uh, we're finding, because of the incredible job done by the American people, in conjunction with everybody — governors, the military, federal government, state government, local government, I've had a lot of conversations with New York City and Mayor de Blasio. I've gotten to know him. I didn't know him. I've gotten to know him. Uh, and uh, a lot of people are working hard. Everybody's working hard. A lot of people are doing a great job, I'll tell you that. A lot of people are doing a great job. But the goal is that all Americans have been sacrificing to achieve these uh, last few weeks uh, things that a lot of people thought were not possible to achieve. And I think we've more than achieved, but we have to go through. Again, we're going to have a rough week. We're going to have maybe a rough little more than a week. And — but there's tremendous light at the end of that tunnel. I said it last time, said it last night. There's tremendous light at the end of the tunnel. There's so many things happening with therapeutics, with vaccines, with uh, things that we really want. Uh, Deborah, Tony, they're all working so hard on this. But those therapeutics — I mean, look, the vaccines are going to be always a little bit later because of that testing period. But the therapeutics, getting the kind of things that I heard about today, talking to these brilliant companies and brilliant people on the phone was fantastic. It was such an incredible conversation. And uh, I also spoke just a few minutes ago with Vice President — former Vice President Biden, who called. And uh, we had a really wonderful, warm conversation. It was a very nice conversation. We talked about — uh, pretty much this. This is what we talked about. This is what everyone's talking about. This is what they want to talk about. And uh, he gave me his point of view, and I fully understood that. And uh, we just had a very friendly conversation. Uh, lasted probably 15 minutes. And uh, it was really good. It was really good. Really nice. I think it was very much so. I appreciate his calling. As we continue our efforts to develop treatments and cures this afternoon, I spoke with leaders of 
the American pharmaceutical companies, and just to give you their names, uh, Amgen, Genentech, Gilead, Regeneron. These are four of the greatest in the world for uh, doing exactly what they're doing. And currently, 10 different therapeutic agents are in active trials, and some are looking incredibly successful, but we have to go through a process. And it's going to be a fairly quick process, I will tell you, based on what the FDA told me. And another 15 are in plans for clinical trials. So they're advancing rapidly. And today, a second company announced that the FDA has authorized its vaccine candidate to begin clinical trials. So you have Johnson & Johnson is already there. I believe they're the one that's first. And now we have a second company that just uh, just announced, and we were just uh, was just approved. So we have two companies at that level for the vaccine itself. We've now performed 100, well, if you think of this, 1.79 million tests. That's 1,790,000 tests nationwide. And I think we're going to put up a screen here someplace that they're on queue. They're just on queue. And here it is. Uh, this is the process starting on uh, 5 March and ending right there, right about now, right? That's about it. Yesterday. So, uh, and it's going up uh, at a rapid rate. Uh, nobody has done more testing. And one of the reasons why they say, and I, I think I can say this, Deborah, very strongly, but one of the reasons that we have more cases is we've done more, more testing. If I went to some of these countries that have, in my opinion, far more people than we do that had the problem. And if we did the kind of testing proportionally that we're doing, they'd have many more cases than us. But we have more cases because we do much more testing. So when you do the testing, you have cases. Otherwise, you wouldn't know about the cases. People sit home, you don't know about it. But we have now done 1,790,000 tests nationwide. That's more than any other country in the world. Hence, we have more cases. And uh, that number is growing by nearly 125,000 people per day. Think of that one. So it's growing by 125,000 people per day. Uh, I told you about South Korea. This is a, uh, you know, vastly faster. And we also have, they say, the most accurate of tests. CVS is launching, and they've been great. Uh, two new drive-through testing sites in Atlanta. Georgia and Providence, Rhode Island. And each location would be able to test up to 1,000 patients per day using the ultra-fast five-minute test developed by Abbott Labs. Now they're down to five minutes. They call it the ultra-fast, and it's very accurate. Abbott Labs, I want to thank them. They've been fantastic. We're also speeding urgent economic relief to the American worker and families and the employers. As of today, Tens of thousands of small businesses have applied for more than $40 billion in relief under the Paycheck Protection Program. You've all been reading about it, and it's really — I mean, it's only been going for a couple of days. It's really been performing well. A couple of little glitches, minor glitches, that have already been taken care of what they say. These funds will result in nearly 2 million jobs being preserved, so we're taking care of our workers, small businesses and our workers, nearly 3,000 Lenders have already made loans under the program, and we're signing up additional lenders very quickly, rapidly. Uh, community banks have been very responsive, and larger banks are also stepping up. If this pro if, if we run out of funds, by the way, we're already preparing because it's going so fast for the small businesses and their employees. Uh, we'll ask Congress to refill it immediately. But the banks have been great. The big banks, the uh, Bank of America was right up there at the beginning. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase was — was uh, — has been great. After the first day, they really — they really came through. And a lot of the big banks, but the community banks have been fantastic. As we announced last week, we are providing $100 billion in direct support for our hospitals. And the first tranche, $30 billion will be distributed this week. So I want to, want to say one other thing. Our farmers, we love our farmers. And uh, as you know, as of April 1st, the uh, China trade deal, $250 billion — they purchased $250 billion from us, if not more. And uh, of that, 
approximately 50 billion is expected to be with our farmers. So it kicked in as of April 1st, and we'll see how it goes. It seems like they're buying, so we'll let you know uh, how that's going. But they're buying anywhere from 40 to 50 billion dollars worth of our agricultural product. That should have a huge impact on our farmers, a tremendous impact on our farmers, but we're watching it very closely. To fight the medical war, we've mobilized the unbeatable and it just — it is unbeatable — strength of American determination, ingenuity, and compassion. I got to see that when I spoke to the great uh, science — because I call them science companies more than drug companies. They're scientists. We've seen businesses, charities, and private citizens making generous donations. So many people are making donations. We've seen states and cities supporting and helping each other and caring for our citizens. And we've seen Americans of all backgrounds and beliefs uniting together to answer the challenge and rise to the moment. And that's what they're doing. Above all, we've been awed and inspired by the exceptional courage of the doctors, nurses, EMTs, and healthcare workers who are the soldiers of this war. No words can ever express the complete measure of our gratitude for these intrepid heroes. One Cleveland patient credited his medical team for not only saving his life through their skill, but forever changing his life through their example of selfless devotion. Couldn't believe it's so generous he was with his statements. And he talked about their bravery in an area that was in such trouble, an area of that hospital where people were dying. And he talked about their bravery. Another survivor in Houston said simply, I will consider them my angels forever. I will consider them, think of that, my angels forever. As our nation endures the depths of loss and grief, we are also witness to the summit of American virtue, character, and courage. With the love and dedication of every American patriot, we will win this battle, we will defeat this enemy, and we will rise from this present crisis with new strength, unity, and resolve. And that's what's happening. Uh, tremendous stories are coming out of this uh, horrible moment, very dark moment for the world. 182. I was saying 151 for a while, and then it got up to 160. And it's 182, as I announced yesterday. 182 countries are being attacked by this virus. So uh, I just want to thank everybody. I want to thank the American citizens for doing a great job. Stay inside, and uh, let's win this, and let's get our country open as soon as we can. I think it's going to be sooner than people think. Things are going really well. Again, light at the end of the tunnel. And with that, I'll take a few questions, and then Mike is going to take over and uh, talk with the Admiral and with uh, the professionals, and we appreciate you being here. Yes, please. Mr. President, you mentioned that you were asking U.S. drug companies to provide treatment to the British Prime Minister. What yes. sort of treatment is that? Is that something that is available? Well, it's a very – yeah, it's a very complex treatment of things that they've just recently developed and that they have uh, a lot of experience with having to do with something else, but recent for this. And uh, they'll be uh, – they've already concurred – they've already uh, had meetings with the doctors, and uh, we'll see whether or not they want to go that route. But when you're in intensive care, it's a big deal. So uh, they're there, and they're uh, ready. I think we have all, we have three of them. We ha I spoke with four, you know, who the four would be. And uh, you know the people within those. You probably — you'd know the companies. I told you the companies. But the people are the greatest — the greatest in the world. So they're at the hospital, and we'll see. And they have um, — they have everything with them, should it be needed. Hopefully, hopefully it won't have to be needed, but should it be needed. I just — I found him — I found Boris to be a fantastic person, just like a, a fantastic, warm, strong, smart guy. He loves his country. You see that? I mean, he fought like — like hell for his country. And uh, intensive care is big stuff, really big stuff. Yesterday, you were asked about this as well. But uh, now that he's been moved to intensive care, does that give you and the vice president any pause or additional concerns, steps that you're taking to preserve well, the continuity I, of government here? No, I don't think so. Mike had his test a couple of days ago. I had my test a couple of days ago. So uh, — and we're here, and here you are. 
So no, I don't think so. But I think we'll probably, uh, just because of questions like that, I think we'll probably have maybe quite a few tests. It's not the worst idea. You know, the the system of testing now is so quick and so easy. So I could see. And you were tested again today. You sure you're okay? I'm okay. Good. Then I'm staying here. Yeah. Despite the nearly 1.8 million tests that you say the United States has done, the Inspector General for the Department of Health and Human Services released a report today, a survey of more than 300 hospitals across the country, and the number one complaint from those hospitals were severe shortages of testing supplies and well, a really long wrong. wait time. I mean, it's a week wrong. or longer. And did I hear the word Inspector General? Really? Uh, it's wrong. And they'll talk to you about it. It's wrong. But this is your own government. Uh, it's well. Where did he come from, the Inspector General? What's his name? It came from the Inspector General. No, what's his report. name? What's I don't his know his name. Well, off the find top me of his my name. Head. Let me know, okay? But, if you find me his name, I'd appreciate it. But sir, these are hospitals. All I can tell you is not, this: sir, we put up on the board. Hospitals. You're going to ask. You're going to ask the admiral. But sir, these are we are doing. Who say that they're waiting a week or longer fine. to get their we'll test to the results? Admiral. Why? But we've done more testing so and had more results than any country anywhere in the world. They're doing an incredible job. Now they're all calling us. They want our testing. What are we doing? How do you do the five-minute test? How do you do the 15-minute test? So give me the name of the Inspector General. Uh, could politics be entered into that? Go ahead, this please. Is our Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Um, are you worried about uh, retaliation to your decision uh, to ban export of medical goods like Indian Prime Minister Modi's decision to not export hydro hydroxychloroquine to the United States and other countries. I don't like that decision. If that's, I don't. I didn't hear that that was his decision. Uh, I know that he stopped it for other countries. I spoke to him yesterday. We had a very good talk, and we'll see whether or not that's his. I would be surprised if he would, you know, because India does very well with the United States. For many years, they've been uh, taking advantage of the United States on trade. So I would be surprised if that were his decision. He'd have to tell me that. I spoke to him Sunday morning, called him. And I said, we'd appreciate your allowing our supply to come out. If he doesn't allow it to come out, that would be okay. But, of course, there may be retaliation. Why wouldn't there be? Yeah, please. Thank you, Mr. President. The Paycheck Protection Program has gotten off to a confusing start for small businesses. I don't think so. I because, think it's done well, very well, well, Wells Fargo has stopped taking applications. Bank of America Not anymore, they have prioritized taking applications from clients that were already borrowed. Bank of America has so been the leader, taking tremendous numbers of applications. And, of course, there may have been they wanted to have a slightly different application. They wanted to have a little different information. Uh, but Bank of America has been a leader. They're number one in terms of applications. I wish you'd ask the question differently. Why don't you say it's gotten off to a tremendous start, but there are some little glitches, which, by the way, have been worked out. It would be so much nicer if you do that. But you're just what incapable of asking a question sir, in a positive way. Is the federal government it's already in done. Place it's already to done. Ensure that there is it's taken the measures. It's taken the measures. And we may even do a different system, not with this. We're going to have to probably add more money to this to save and to keep our small businesses going and to keep the employees of those small businesses working. But it's such a positive event, and you ask it in such a negative way. It's just, I wish. I wish we had a fair media in this country, and we really don't. Speaking of unfair, go ahead. Mr. President, the acting secretary of the Navy told the crew of the USS Roosevelt that Captain Crozier was either, quote, too naive or too stupid to be in command. Is it appropriate for the chief officer of the Navy to be speaking this way about this captain? Is this well, I haven't heard it exactly. I haven't heard. I heard they had a... Uh, a statement that was made, uh, if that were the statement. It's a strong statement. Look, um, the letters shouldn't have been sent, and certainly they shouldn't have been leaked. This is a military operation. Uh, I must tell you, I've heard very good things about uh, the gentlemen, both gentlemen, by the way. I will say this by, about both gentlemen. And uh, I may look into it only from the standpoint that uh, something should be resolved, because I'm hearing good things about both people. Look into, sir? I may just get involved, if it's okay with you. Oh, you mean? You yeah, because you know what? You have two good people, and they're arguing. And I'm good, believe it or not, at settling arguments. I'm good at settling these arguments. So I may look into it in great detail, in detail, and I'll be able to figure it out very fast. But that was a statement. It's a rough statement. But, but look, look, you look, decide it was letters should not have been sent. 
to many people, unclassified. Uh, that was a mistake. Uh, it's a mistake that shouldn't have been made because it's unfair to the families of the people on the ship because they get nervous, and it shows weakness. And there's nothing weak about us now, not anymore. We have the strongest military we've ever had, and we're not going to be showing weakness to anybody because we have — that ship is incredible, nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. And we don't want to be doing writing letters. We don't want to have letter-writing campaigns where the fake news finds a letter or gets a leak. We don't want that. So the letter — excuse me. So the letter shouldn't have been sent. With all of that said, his career prior to that was very good. So I'm going to get involved and see exactly what's going on there, because I don't want to destroy somebody for having a bad day. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Mr. President, uh, Vice President Biden's uh, spokesperson said that he made some suggestions uh, to you about actions that you could be taking to he deal did. with the pandemic. He did. We had a very good talk. We, we agreed that we weren't going to talk about what we said, but we had a very, very good talk. It was a warm talk. Uh, I enjoyed it. I hope he enjoyed it, too. And it was short. It was 15 minutes. Uh, Did you have good suggestions? Anything that you're going to do? Well, he had suggestions. It doesn't mean that I agree with those suggestions, but certainly he had suggestions. And uh, I also told him some of the things we're doing. But the conversation was a, a friendly, very friendly conversation. Yeah, please. Thanks a lot, Mr. President. Uh, you've mentioned other members of your task force have mentioned uh, over the course of the next two weeks it's going to be a very difficult time for our country in terms of fatalities. And it, there, it will be a difficult week and a half. Yeah. And there are a number of governors who are close allies of yours, Mr. President, who have refrained thus far to have these stay-at-home orders. And Dr. Fauci, who, of course, is on your, your task force, has said that sure. uh, it would — the states that don't have stay-at-home orders are putting themselves at risk and the country at Well, risk. if Dr. You, Fauci you said that, that, I would be inclined to call them up. Yeah. You know, we do have a constitutional problem in doing that. You understand that. I mean, there's a double — there's a double-edged sword. You understand. Uh, I can do it, but it is a constitutional — you can say Federalist, you can say there's lots of different reasons uh, where I would rather have the governors uh, do it, make their own determination. Uh, they're smaller — and not in all cases, but sort of they're smaller cases. But I'm not sure 100 percent that Dr. Fauci said that, but you can ask him. Tony, do you want to say something? Please. So I had — I had good conversations with the governor of Nebraska. Uh, and the governor of Iowa here. And it's, it's interesting that functionally, even though they have not given a strict stay at home, what they are doing is really functionally equivalent to that. And, and we had a really good conversation with, with both of the governors. And, and uh, it, you know, when I had mentioned that, uh, I think there was a public response that they weren't really doing anything at all. And they really are doing a very good job, both of them. Those are the only two that I spoke to. But, but it was a really good conversation. And I want to make sure people understand that just because they don't have a very strict stay-at-home order, they have in place a lot of things that are totally compatible with what everyone else is doing. If I could ask a question, Dr. Fauci, before you go ahead. Um, about getting back to normal, you said you wanted to get back to normal uh, as, as soon as possible. Will we truly get back to normal in this country before there's an actual vaccine that's available to everybody? What, in, how, how, do you, how do you start lifting the restrictions? Yeah, well, well John, if, if back to normal means acting like there never was a coronavirus problem, I, I don't think that's going to happen until we do have a situation where you can completely protect the population. But when we say getting back to normal, we mean something very different from what we're going through right now. Because right now, we are in a very intense mitigation. When we get back to normal, we will go back gradually to the point where we can function as a society. But you're absolutely right. I mean, if you want to get to pre-coronavirus, you know, that might not ever happen in the sense of the, the fact that the threat is there. But I believe with the therapies that will be coming online and with the fact that I feel confident that over a period of time, we will get a good vaccine that we will never have to get back to where we are right back now. So if that means getting back to normal, then we'll get back to normal. I think that with the therapies, and I think that with the vaccines, which I have total confidence are coming, and I'm dealing with the companies, I'm talking to Johnson & Johnson, I'm talking to all of them, uh, I think that when you add the tremendous stimulus that we're giving, like, for instance, deductibility for restaurant expenses for restaurants and entertainment, uh, the money that we're talking about for small businesses and employees to keep everybody working, and other things that we're, frankly, working on right now. 
which are going to be great for our people. I think when you add that to it, I think we can get more than back to normal from an economic standpoint. Actually be better, but more than back to normal. But I, I would agree that uh, we'd love to see a vaccine, but immediately we'd love to see a therapeutic. And I think we're getting very close. Do you think you'll be able to lift restrictions on April 30th right now? I, I don't want to comment on that, but I can tell you that uh, we certainly want to try. We certainly want to see what, what's going on. We're doing very well. Look, you look at those, you look at most places where that, you can call it the bump, you can call it the hill, you can call it the mountain, you can call it whatever you want to do. It. It's very flat. You take a look, and that was done through mitigation. That was done through a lot of good work. Um, and that far exceeded our expectations before. I mean, you people can't even believe how how low some of those bumps are, some of those hills are. They're very surprised. Now, you have a couple of tough ones. New Jersey's been very tough, and New York has been very tough. Uh, they're crowded in. You know, it's tight. It's tougher. But uh, we, far exceeding. Uh, California far exceeds. Washington State far exceeds. Uh, you look at so many of these states, how well they're doing. Uh, the eight states, by the way, and I haven't spoken to the uh, governors, but Tony's so right. They may not have it uh, from the standpoint that they're saying it, but those people are practicing it, and they're doing a fantastic job. Take a look at where they are in terms of the levels, but take a look where they are. So, uh, but if I thought it, it was something that and I've looked at him, and I've looked at him very carefully, I looked at him today, I looked at him yesterday. Uh, from a constitutional standpoint, I'd love not to get involved with that. And not from a legal standpoint, just from a moral constitutional standpoint. Because legally, I, I can. But morally, I, you know, I believe in our Constitution much more so than most people. And I'd love to be able to let the governors do what they have to do. Uh, those states are doing a fantastic job, all eight of them. They're doing a fantastic job. So we'll see what happens. As for your question, you fully understand what I'm saying. So thank you. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, two questions, if I may. One from somebody outside the room. But first, uh, Kaskam, um, do you think uh, Boris Johnson, when he talked about uh, shaking hands of hospital patients, did he downplay the threat of this virus too much? Um, and, and do you know exactly what this current well, I think is? Boris was looking at it differently. He was looking at it earlier. He was looking at it like uh, write it out. There were many people thinking about writing it out, meaning, you know, whatever it is, it is. But then you see what starts to happen, and the numbers become monumental, and they decide not to do that. Uh, we actually moved early. We moved early because of what we did with respect to the ban on China coming in, and then Europe coming in. That was an early ban, too. And then UK. Uh, so, uh, no, he, he waited a little while, and he, he felt that. But he got, you know, he, he made a decision very quickly thereafter to do what they did. And they, they've gone through a very strict lockdown. But they're suffering greatly as a uh, nation right now. They're going through a lot. You know, they're, they're uh, a nation that's having a difficult time. But uh, I've gotten to know him. He's just such an incredible guy. It was just so shocking to see that, because you know what that means. Intensive care is a big deal with regard to what we're talking about. That's a very big deal, very scary deal. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. Somebody who can't be in the room due to social distancing has asked me to ask a question. It's uh, Thomas Howell of The Washington Times. How many health workers in the U.S. have become infected with COVID-19? And if the answer is not known, will the CDC be publishing that data Yeah, I could give you that information. I think that I think they'd probably be willing to give that, right? Yeah, we could get you that information. Jeff, please. Uh, Mr. President, OPEC is meeting on Thursday, and yeah. they have said that they are willing to make a cut in production if the U.S. chips in as well, which suggests that they want you to ask U.S. producers to do a Well, you're the first one that told me that. I don't know. We'll have to make that decision. And maybe we will, maybe we won't, but we'll have to make that decision. But you I think the cuts are automatic if you're a believer in markets. I can guarantee you there's a cut from pre this condition. You know, look, this happened because of the virus. The virus knocked out 40%. It was it went down in one hour. I mean, literally, when places close up, you're talking about a 40% cut. No, I think it's happening automatically, but nobody's asked me that question yet, so we'll see what happens. I'll, would I'll let you know on Thursday evening. All right, that's the deal. But, okay. you, but you would consider asking U.S. companies to well, I think it's automatic because they're already cutting. I mean, if you look, they're cutting back. 
because it's like it's market, it's demand, it's supply and demand. They're already cutting back, and they're cutting back very seriously. But if OPEC yeah. is asking for a signal from well, the nobody's US. asking that. So if they ask me, I'll make a decision. Okay, but I'll. But again, it's happening anyway. Yes, please. In light of all the discussion about Prime Minister Johnson and his health, can you update us on the status of the second half of your physical that you were going to have this year? Yeah, so I had a physical. The first half was very successful. I did it uh, on a day when I was in the White House, and we were able to do that, as the doctor reported. And I have some uh, — the second half of the physical different. Uh, probably is done at Walter Reed, and I'll do that at the appropriate time. But I feel very good, and according to the doctor, uh, very good shape. Well, can I just ask you again on the idea of a national stay-at-home recommendation? What is giving you so much pause about making I told a recommendation? You. I told you. He understood very well. I appreciate right. your understanding. But it's not an order. It's called just the a Constitution of the United States, and. I'd rather have, if possible, for the governors to make the decision. If a decision was very necessary, and they have done a good job, and Tony said it better than anybody, they are they are doing they are doing what we're asking them to do without having to put the seal on it. But I will say, if I thought it was necessary, I'll do it in a heartbeat. Do you agree with the Georgia governor opening the beaches? Opening what? The beaches. I haven't seen. I'm going to have to see to what extent. I'm going to have to see. How many people you're talking about? Are they crowded? Are they packed? Are they not packed? We'll have to take a look at it. Right now, it's very early for beaches in Georgia. So right now, very early. So I'll take a look at it. Uh, he's done a very good job as the governor. He knows what he's doing, but we'll have to take a look. It really does depend on, you know, how crowded it may be. But I will talk to him, and I will ask him that question. I would ask him, yeah, please. Uh, Mr. President, you said last week that you were considering uh, travel restrictions around hotspots. Is that something that's still on the table, and at what point? We're looking at it, and the uh, airlines have been cutting their routes. You saw that yesterday. They announced big cuts in routes. Uh, we need some uh, some flights for emergency use for uh, military people. We need some flights for medical people, and there are very few flights, as you know. And the flights that are going out are, I think they said they're three to four percent. Uh, full. Uh, you have 3 percent of the plane is occupied. So it's uh, — they're very, very — generally very, very empty planes. Uh, but it's good to have — it's a — it's a tiny amount of flights relative to the overall. And we need them also for medical workers. For, otherwise, we're going to have to do a whole big thing with our own planes. So uh, they're — they're done for a reason. There's also testing done when people get onto those planes and also when people get off the planes. If I can follow up on, on this question of the HHS Inspector General, and by the way, her name was Christy Grimm, and it wasn't so much her opinion, but they interviewed uh, 323 different hospitals. Oh, it still could be her opinion. Uh, when was she appointed? When was she appointed? Uh, I'm not sure when she was Would appointed. Would you do me a favor? Let I'll, me know. I'll, I'll check. No, no, let me know now. I have to know now, John. Let me know now. Because we are doing an incredible job in testing. Uh, we are doing a better job than anybody in the world right now in testing. There's nobody close. And other nations admit this. Other nations have admitted it very strongly. Other nations are calling us, wanting to know about our testing. Let me know when she was appointed, would you? But specifically, ahead, what please. she was saying was that there had been a delay in the — OK, thank you very much. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. Only last week, there were multiple pl uh, flights coming from China full of medical supplies. Yes. Companies like Huawei and Alibaba have been donating right. to the United States, People like 1.5 well. million and 95 masks and also a lot of medical gloves and uh, much more medical supplies. So, Sounds like a statement more than a question. And ambassador, uh, Chinese ambassador Cui Tiankai last night wrote an op-ed on New York Times calling to cooperation with the United States. So are you personally working directly with China? We just signed a trade deal. So fighting with the It's virus. the biggest deal probably ever made. And I hope they're going to honor that trade deal. If they don't honor the trade deal, then I'll tell you a different answer. But I think they will. They're going to spend billions of dollars for agriculture. They're going to spend billions of dollars for many different things, whereas well, China never supply. spent money in our country. We spent money. We had a deficit, a trade deficit with China for years of $500 billion, $400 billion. We had the biggest trade deficits in the history of the world with China. Now China's going to spend a lot — has agreed to spend $250 billion 
many billions of dollars in our country, much of it going to farmers and manufacturers. So I'll let you know. I mean, I, I hope they're going to honor the deal. We'll find with out. With China, are you cooperating with I don't China? Know. Uh, who are you working for, China? You work know, for China or are you with a newspaper? Kong, who are you with? Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Who owns that, China? It's is it owned by China? Hong Kong. No, is it owned by the state? No, it's not. It's a private owned company. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, look, I'll let you know. I'll give you a good answer to that in a few months. I wanted to see what they do. Because it's time for them to help us, okay? It's time right now for China to help us. And hopefully they do. And if they don't, that's okay, too. But we signed a deal. It was signed in with great goodwill and spirit. And it's time that our farmers benefited, our manufacturers benefited. And we'll see whether or not that deal is honored. And I think it will be, because I know President Xi, who I like and respect, and I think he will honor the deal he made with us. It just went into effect four days ago. I will see whether or not. In fact, I called up just a little while ago. I said, how are the farmers doing with respect to China? Are they buying the product as anticipated? And the answer was, yeah, I think so. But it wasn't the most positive, but it was it was starting. It was start the deal just started. So uh, I'll let you know. But, you know, for many, many years, China ate our lunch because we had people in this position that I'm in right now that allowed China to get away with absolute murder. And it should have never happened. But we are uh, we are now dealing with China. We'll see what happens. Yes, Mr. President, Mr. President, President, President uh, wait, wait, wait. I'll, I'll tell you how many do you want. To, how many do you want to ask? So I, just, I was going to answer your question you asked me. She was appointed in January of this year to her current position Good. as the principal deputy inspector. Okay, General. we're going to take a look Mr. at it. Go ahead. I know you don't President, want to talk. Uh, on, on the don't, issue, don't of, he's, on, he's on issue of small business loans, sir, you said that businesses have applied for $40 billion in loans. But can you tell us how much of that money has actually gone out to the small businesses? Uh, I can't tell you, but I know it goes out very quickly once the loan application is approved. And it, the process is very fast. And you have to understand, these are banks, and that's what they do. But they were swamped. They were actually swamped. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. I know you don't want to talk about the Inspector General report, but testing is still a big issue in this country. What, when can hospitals put the, expect? Put the slide up again, please. When can Just hospitals expect to receive a quick turnaround of these test ready? results? Are you ready? Hospitals can do their own testing also. States can do their own testing. States are supposed to be doing testing. Hospitals are supposed to be doing testing. Do you understand that? We're the Why federal government. Listen to me. We're the federal government. We're not supposed to stand on street corners doing testing. They go to doctors. They go to hospitals. They go to the state. The state is a more localized government. You have 50 of them. And they can go 50 within here. You also have territories, as you know. And they do the testing. And if you look at the chart, if you take a look, did they put it up? Yeah. Just take a look. And these are testing, and the results are now coming in very quickly. Initially speaking, the tests were old, obsolete, and not really prepared. We have a brand new testing system that we developed very quickly, and that's your result. And you should say, congratulations, great job, instead of being uh, so horrid in the way you ask a question. Please, go ahead. Sir, Mr. President, today. Yeah, I'd love to have the Admiral speak to that question. Yes, it's a great idea. So I can talk a little bit more about testing later on, but um, as the President said, 1.79 million tests have been done, and this does not count the hundreds of thousands of tests that are done within hospitals that are now currently not reporting, so I'm sure we're well over 2 million. Um, that Inspector General report was done here, 23rd, 24th, during our ramp-up period, um, quite a long time ago. Uh, there was clearly, and it's hard to interpret the report because it mixes up all kinds of things, but clearly um, there was complaints by some hospitals of a backlog probably at send out tests, and, and that is true. There were several days of backlog at some of the major labs that have been taken care of. We know now that the ACLA labs now have a 24 to 48 hour turnaround. They're doing well over 100,000 tests a day. We now have the Abbott machine that's point of care. That's 18,000 of those instruments throughout the country. The Cepheid machine is now uh, all across the country with a 45-minute turnaround. Um, so um, we have worked directly with many of the hospitals uh, that have their own laboratory-derived tests. 
Um, some of those uh, r really, quite frankly, didn't understand the regulatory freedom they have to use other uh, different kinds of instruments or different kinds of reagents. So um, like, they do like they do now, uh, like they do now, and I'm on the phone with them all the time to make sure that everything is clear. We have a 24-hour call number. But that's what it was, it was there for. And um, I don't know the inspector general. I don't know that person. I tell you one thing I have a problem with. If there was such a problem that she knew about or he knew about on March 23rd and 24th, why did I find out about the test from them on the, on the news media at 8 o'clock this morning? If there was a problem, I think you're ethically obliged to tell me where that is so we can interact with it like I do every single day. But that's a discussion for the future. I think testing is really in a good position right now, and I'd be happy to expand on some of the really good tests that are coming up. How long has that person been in government? Uh, did serve in the previous administration. Oh, you didn't tell me that. Oh, I see. You didn't tell me that, John. You didn't tell me that. Did, did serve in the previous administration. You mean the Obama administration. Thank you for telling me that. See, there's a typical well, fake news deal. You asked me when, deal. She, you asked now, me when look, she was appointed. Look. I told you when she was appointed. You're a third-rate reporter. And what you just said is a disgrace, okay? You asked me, you said, sir, just got appointed. Take a look at what you said now. I said, when did they, when did this person, how long in government? But, but well, it was appointed in the Obama administration. Sir, Thank, you much, Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much. You will never make it. Go ahead, please. Uh, on, the, on the ventilators, well, that's uh, a this terrible. is best for Admiral Jawar, but how, can you tell us today how many ventilators are in the federal stockpile? Yeah. I'm not going to tell you how many are in the stockpile, but I can tell you that we look at ventilator use granularly every single day in every single state and down to the hospital level. So we have been able to meet and easily meet all the ventilator requirements that have been brought us to us by the state. No one has not gotten a ventilator that needs a ventilator. And as far as we can project looking at all models, every person who needs a ventilator will get a ventilator. I'm a ventilator doc, right? I'm an ICU physician for children. Spent every day of my life managing people on ventilators. This is my community. It's also the Surgeon General's community as an anesthesiologist. So what we have in the stockpile, I think, is not a number that we, we give out, but we have thousands remaining in the stockpile. And now you're seeing out of the, out of the appropriate American spirit that when a state like Washington or uh, California doesn't need that ventilator, they're doing the right thing by moving them around the country. It's about 9,000, just so you understand. That's right. It's about 9,000. And by the way, you didn't tell me also that this inspector general came out of the Obama administration. You didn't tell me that. Sir. Okay, please, go ahead. Uh, I'm, go ahead. I'm looking, sir, I'm just quickly here, I'm looking at the, this inspector general's bio. She appears to have served in government since 1999, but I was hoping to ask you about uh, that your call with uh, former Vice President Joe Biden. Is there something that you learned on that phone call, and has that changed your no, opinion? No, I understood his views before the call. Has that changed your opinion about speaking to people? I like just think he's a very nice, I think he's a nice man. I've always thought he was a nice man. I've, I don't know him. I don't know if I ever spoke to him before, other than to say hello. Uh, but I think he's a nice man. We had a very nice call. And you want to seek now the counsel of some of your predecessors, George Bush, No, but Barack we Obama. may, uh, no, not really. Uh, we may, we're doing a great job. Hey. I inherited, we, this administration, we inherited a broken system, both militarily, where we've rebuilt our military, where we now have so much ammunition, where, as you remember, a very important general said, sir, we have no ammunition. They wanted to save money on ammunition. They didn't want to save money because they spent money like nobody ever spent money. But you know what? Uh, we now have a great military rebuilt, and we have so much ammunition, we don't know what to do with it, okay? And that's a nice feeling to have. But they also gave us empty cupboards. The cupboard was bare. You've heard the expression? The cupboard was bare. So we took over a stockpile where the cupboard was bare and where the testing system was broken and old. And we redid it. And frankly, it would be OK for a small event, but not for a big event. And they had a chance to do it. Somebody said that uh, a certain person, I won't tell you, but a certain person said this will happen. Uh, and that's true. The problem is that person never did anything about it, previous administrations in previous admi — they never did anything about it. You know, we all know all about pandemics and all of the things that we're seeing now, but nobody thought it was going to happen. And if we did think it was going to happen, the problem is nobody did anything about it. We did. We have rebuilt the system, and now we're a fine-tuned machine. We built thousands of hotel beds for New York. We moved a ship in that now we're going to make 
for COVID, COVID-19. We are going to make it so that people having this horrible thing happen to them will be able to use the ship. The ship, as I said, is going to be shared with New Jersey, New York and New Jersey. We've done things that are incredible. When you build, what was it, 18 hospitals? We built 18 hospitals. We built medical centers all over the country. Uh, and when you have Gavin Newsom and other uh, governors who really have been very nice and generous in their statements, because they make the statements to the press, not just to my face. Others tell us how great we're doing, like the call that Mike had today. I heard from other people that were on the call. He said it was incredible. It was two hours, and it was everything was positive. They were so happy with what we've done. And we're ready to do more if they need it, because we're ready to march. Uh, the Admiral can tell you, we are sitting there with 9,000 ventilators, and we're ready to march when we see that we can move very quickly. As soon as we see that need, we can move very quickly. We're ready to march. We built a great system. The problem is the Democrats, like a guy like Chuck Schumer, is a total lightweight, by the way. I've known him for a long time. He'll say, why don't you put a military man in charge? Military man? I have all military men. This man is doing an incredible job. We have uh, two admirals, numerous generals. We have the Army Corps of Engineers. We have FEMA. We have this whole force that, like, nobody's ever seen before. We have a great military operation, and they've done an incredible job. And honestly, uh, people should respect, because nobody's ever seen anything like what we've done. And what they end up with, forget about me, don't worry about me. I get, I will only get bad. If I say, how many ventilators do you need, Governor? A thousand would be great. I said, nope, I'm going to send you 10,000. And then you'll call up from the media. You'll say, how did Trump do? We're not happy he didn't send us enough ventilators. Because that's called politics. But if you look at what's happening, that, and I'm even surprised, the governors are saying all good things, but the Democrat governors, and a couple of rhinos, frankly, they're rhinos. That's all they are, one rhino in particular. But the governors are saying great things. He had a call that lasted two hours today. I heard about that call, not just from Mike. It was a perfect call. Now, I'm sure you were on the call, even though you're not supposed to be. I'm sure you were on the call, meaning some of the media was on the call, because they're constantly reporting the call. If they're honest, they will say it was a great call. Okay. Okay. Next question, please. Mr. Here we go. So uh, Here we you, go. you didn't mention the, uh, the hospitals that were built in New Orleans and Dallas today, but you've mentioned them a number of times previously. Uh, there seems to be some concern in Texas that they might lose the hospital in Dallas uh, if it's not. We're used. never going to do anything that if, hurts if Texas. It's not used yet. We're only we're only the helping Texas. Is there By the way, the governor's doing a great job over there with this situation. Mm -hmm. And Texas is so big, you have some parts of the state that are affected, other parts that aren't affected at all. You know, it's an incredible place. But can they keep this hospital, even if it's unused? Or is the federal government going to shift those resources elsewhere? Well, we're going to use whatever we need, and we're doing it totally in conjunction with the governor. Okay? We're doing it in conjunction with your Texas governor, who's done a fantastic the, job. Great. Governor Abbott also has uh, set up checkpoints at the border to uh, check people coming yep. in from Louisiana. We've seen checkpoints in Florida, other state borders. Americans are Very few really people are coming through our border, and you'll be happy to know we're up to mile 161 no, 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 of the wall. Internal borders between states. Oh, Americans I see. Okay. Are not but used on the border between Mexico, we have 161 miles of wall. About internal borders. Okay. Americans don't they're not used to seeing border checkpoints between states. How much longer? And is that something that states well, I mean, have to deal with you? First, you want us to call eight governors and tell them to do something. And then you're complaining that another governor is so strict that he actually checks the borders. I understand why he's doing that, because he, he knows who he has, and he doesn't want people coming in if they should maybe, you know, is not be to, is to the liking the of the doctors. Decide? No, I think it's... Look, he's done a great job. He's done a great job with this case, as have many other governors, but he's done a great job uh, one of the things I thought you were going to say is we've been very tough on our southern border, as you know, very, very tough. And part of that's because of the fact that we have so much, you know, when you talk about 160 miles of new wall, nobody's coming through that. Nobody, not even close. And uh, we're building it rapidly. We will have early next year, we'll have close to 500 miles of wall, which is what our goal was.
You mentioned uh, Senator uh, Schumer just a moment ago. He had a conference call today, and he said that he believes that a COVID-4 relief bill will be necessary. Do you share that belief? And what would be contained in such I, I a I don't bill? know necessarily, but I certainly want to listen. And what I want to do is two things. A real infrastructure, not a Green New Deal. You know, the carbon footprint. I'm not looking for the carbon footprint. We want to put people to work. But a real, and frankly, for so many years, we've let our infrastructure go to hell because we were wasting all our money in the Middle East and other places, okay? I want to rebuild our country. I don't want to rebuild that. We're tired. We've, built, we've rebuilt, if you call it that, or destroyed, frankly. What we've done is so crazy. What we have done, the direction that this country has taken is so sad. But we're in the Middle East for $8 trillion. And if you want to fix a pothole in a highway, you can't do it because they don't want to give you the funds. So we want to have an infrastructure bill, a real one, like in the vicinity of $2 trillion to completely rebuild our roads, our bridges, our highways, our, our tunnels, everything. Uh, and I'm totally open to listening to that. I'm also open to listening to and, and even uh, putting forward, because we're going to be putting something forward, more money for our citizens, because they've gone through trauma. This has been trauma. This came out of nowhere. When, and I say it, and I'll say it again. We had the greatest economy in the history of the world. We had the most people working in the history of our country, almost 160 million people, far more than ever before. And then one day, our professionals correctly came to us, and they said, sorry, sir, we have to close down our country. And I said, say it again. Say it again. We have to close down our country. And the entire world closed down because of this hidden enemy. No, we, uh, we're going to take good care of our people. It was not their fault. Uh, uh, Dr. Burks, to clarify something that she said on Saturday. Sir. Yes, please. May I ask Dr. Burks to clarify something that uh, she said on Saturday? Uh, if I may, uh, Dr. Burks, this is a, a question that comes from a, a radio colleague of mine, uh, Tamara Keith. And on Saturday, it sounded like you said that for the next week, people in high-risk areas should not even uh, go to the market or the drugstore. Is that what you meant to say, or, or is that accurate? You know, out of respect for every single health care worker that's on the front line, whether they're a nurse, a doctor, a respiratory therapist, the phlebotomist, the persons who come in the rooms to clean, you know, out of respect for them, we as Americans should be doing everything possible. And what I meant was, if you can consolidate, if you can send one person, the entire family doesn't need to go out on these occasions. Um, we really need, this is a highly transmittable virus. Um, we've been saying that we want every American to know that what they're doing is making a difference, but we need to have solidarity of commitment from everyone um, to really, so, you know, maybe once every two weeks we can do a grocery store and pharmacy shop for the entire family. So it was really about we have to do everything we can. I know I see on the TV stations the level of human suffering in the hospitals. Um, Dr. Fauci and I and Admiral Girard have spent our lives taking care of others. We need to take care of each other now as Americans and do everything that's in those guidelines. And I know they're tough. I know incredibly how tough they are. My grandchild of 10 months got a fever of 105 this weekend. I'm the doctor, <laughs> and I couldn't get there. I mean, so I'm trying to explain to my daughter how to listen to her lungs, how to listen to her lungs so and then the baby's lungs. There. You did not get there? <laughs> I did not go there. Good, I'm very happy <laughs> Because of you two. <laughs> I mean, when you, you, can't, you can't take that kind of risk with the leaders of the country. Your grandson's okay. So, daughter, but she's um, that's coming out. That's a lot out. of temperature. Yes. But, you know, we're all, and that's just an illustration that I know you all are making sacrifices. And I guess I want everyone to take this seriously. So that was really a call of seriousness of how important this is and how we're starting to see the impact. But you can see what can happen when you come at this a little bit too late. And that's why the message before you see it, before you have to see your hospitals and your emergency rooms overwhelmed, it is on us 
as a member of this community of this country to do everything possible to save one another. And so that was really what I was saying, and I will continue to say that, because I do believe it's making a difference. You can start to see it making a difference, but we have to do even more right now, because that will predict where we are two or three weeks from now. Thank you, Deborah. And it is making a big difference. I saw where Governor Cuomo was a little bit upset today over the weekend, a lot of people outside, and they were, uh, they were, uh, pretty gr big groups of people. I saw that. I noticed that. And he wasn't happy with that. And I could understand that. Look, we have a period, a short period of time. Hopefully, it's a short period of time to go. And let's get it done. Let's get it done. Kristen, did you have a question? Yes, I do. Thank You're you. You're so quiet. Quick follow to, just got here. Apologies. you have your own show. Um, <laughs> no. Quick follow to the question about legislation. I know there's discussion about a phase four. Yeah. But are you also looking seriously at a second round of direct payments? And are you putting discussions on a potential phase four on hold for now while you pursue that? Well, I was opposed to the way of distribution, money distribution, through, as you know, unemployment and through the state offices, because they have very old, com not all of them, but many of them have 40-year-old equipment, as I've said, and it makes it very difficult. But that's what they're looking, that's what they want to do. That's the way it's mandated to do. I thought it would be better if we did a direct payment system. But the Democrats really wanted it. And I think they had some some help from a couple of people that I would have, uh, if, had I spoken to them, I would have convinced them otherwise, I really believe. But so, but it's getting out. And the federal government has done its job. All we can do is give this massive amount of money to the states. The states then are responsible to distribute it, a little bit like we're talking about here. But uh, the money will be right on time from the federal government. Then the states have to do their job in getting it out. There needs to be a second round of those payments. Uh, we could very well do a second round of direct. I would do it direct. That, is that under serious discussion? Uh, under, it is absolutely under serious consideration. And in terms of Chuck Schumer, he also said he spoke to your chief of staff um, about potentially appointing a czar to oversee the supply chain. Is that something that you but would consider doing? But we have people doing? that are so talented. Who's the I know the people he suggested. They're wonderful people. They worked here. They're wonderful people. Uh, he's just doing that because it's politics. But who's because the you know what? Right now, Mr. We have many, depending on what. Uh, in terms of testing, this gentleman right here. In term, uh, you know who the point person is? This gentleman right here. He's the one in charge of the task force. But Mike, you may want to tell him about them. Because this is really a military operation. Mr. President, in terms of the supply chain... Let me, let me answer your please, first please, question, please. if I may, because yeah. it's, it's a very good question, and I spoke to Senator Schumer the uh, night before last about just that. When the President signed a declaration of national emergency, he stood up FEMA as the lead agency implementing his policy to marshal a whole-of-government response. And under FEMA... Uh, we provide federal support. The state manages the health care response, and health care providers and first responders implement that response on a local level. Uh, our lead on this issue in implementing it is uh, Administrator Pete Gaynor. But the man managing all of the supplies, and you heard a presentation this weekend about our air bridge, what we also call the control tower. We, we literally, with with Admiral John Polovchik at the helm of our logistics effort. Uh, we have visibility now on all the supplies that are moving across this country and into this country from around the world. Uh, it really is extraordinary. I mean, when the President tapped FEMA to lead this effort, he, we essentially wanted to say, we want to organize this in a military fashion. And we tapped uh, really someone who is widely regarded as the number one supplies and logistics military officer uh, to do just that. Uh, he really is an extraordinary individual. Admiral Jouar has known him for a long time. Uh, and to be working with Admiral Polovchik, we, we speak every morning. Uh, our team uh, reviews the data. Uh, we go over that uh, with, uh, with Administrator Gaynor and Admiral Polovchik. We talk about an extensive team that's identifying supplies around the country and around the world. And then, as we were explaining to governors today, uh, we work with the requests that are coming in from states with a priority on the areas that are dealing with widespread outbreak, like the, the greater New York City area, New Jersey, Louisiana, uh, focus on Detroit, focus on Chicago and Illinois. 
Um, and then what, what Pete Gaynor and Admiral Polovchek are doing is directing those commercial distributors to send the resources directly to the front lines of the battle against the coronavirus. Uh, it, it is an extraordinary system. And as I explained um, to the governors today, as, as I've explained to congressional leaders, uh, who've made a, what I think is a, is a, a good faith recommendation uh, that, we have a, that we organize this in a manner of military logistics, it's exactly what President Trump has done. And it's what we're doing every single day to make sure that health care workers, to make sure that the states that are dealing with a widespread outbreak of coronavirus can be confident that we're going to spare no expense, leave no stone unturned, and use this extraordinary apparatus centered in FEMA to get the people of our country what they need, when they need it, to battle the coronavirus. Thank you. And, Kristen, when Schumer makes a statement like that, he's only doing it for politics. He knows. We have the best generals, the best admirals. We have the best people. These are incredible leaders. These are vibrant people. They've done such a good job. And, again, you'll get a tape of the conversation, because I'm sure some of the governors probably had their favorite reporter listening to the conversation, even though they weren't supposed to, but that's happened before. Just so you understand, uh, we had a call today that was a — Beautiful call, everybody friendly, everybody happy. They also know in some cases we'll get them a little bit more, and if they need it, we'll get them a lot more depending on where this monster is going. But when Schumer does, does that, uh, well, take a look, take a look at the past. Well, you know, you're going to have to tell me who. That, that they certainly dug, well, yeah, some Democrats, because they view this as a campaign issue. They want to make Trump look as bad as they can because they want to try and win an election that they shouldn't be allowed to win based on the fact that we have done a great job. We built the greatest economy in the world. I'll do it a second time. We got artificially stopped by a virus that nobody ever thought possible. And we've handled it, and we've built a team, and we've built an apparatus that's been unbelievable. Take a look at the swine flu, right? That's H1N1. Take a look at that. And it's not the other way around, by the way. It's H1N1. Take a look. You know what I mean by that. Take a look at the swine flu. It was a disaster. 17,000 people died. The other administration, they didn't even know. It was like they didn't even know it was here. And that was peanuts compared to what we have in terms of the power, the magnitude of what we're going through. This is attacking 182 countries simultaneously. So Schumer's just all about politics. I've known him almost all of my adult life. And he's, he's a disgrace. In many ways, he's a disgrace. And he knows it's done. He just wants to do that. But he knows the job we're doing. Everybody's amazed at the job we're doing. And the public is starting to find out. They're start, you know, one of the reasons I do these news conferences, because if I didn't, they would believe fake news. And we can't let them believe fake news. They see us up here. They see us with admirals. They see us with this talent. They see the job that Mike Pence has done, which has been an unbelievable job, an unbelievable job. I put him there. I thought he'd do well. He did great as the governor of Indiana, and I thought Mike would do well. He's done much better than well. And he gets along with people, I think, much better than I do. Because I like people being 100. Mike can put up with things that sometimes I say it's amazing that he can put up with it. But he's done an incredible job, and so has the entire team. This is a military operation. And again, we built 2,900 beds in Javits Center. We, we build medical centers in New York. In Chicago, we built 1,000 beds, much more now, in McCormick Place. That's their big convention hall, the equivalent of Javits Convention Hall. Big McCormick Place, fantastic place. By the way, the mayor of Chicago, at least on the phone, is extremely happy with what we're doing, thanking us, has a great relationship with Mike, thanking us. And I just wish the politicians would say to you what they say to us, really. And it's a good question. Uh, do you have one? Yeah, please. Yes, Mr. And we'll get to you. Uh, a national security question and then a question about uh, Governor Cuomo. On the national security front, uh, to the extent that you can comment on this, your administration is making heavy preparations to move against the cartels in Latin America right now. And I, could you, you said expand, Latin America? Yes. Could yes. you expand on the reasoning 
of why now? Are there supply yeah. and logistics especially weak? Is it political? Yeah. What's the reasoning? Good question. Uh, we've moved a tremendous uh, number of boats and ships uh, to the area of, you know, different areas of exactly where you're talking about because we're tired of drugs pouring into our country from other places. And we're tired of seeing drugs pouring into different parts of Latin America, South America, and just coming into our country. Now we've got them stopped at the border, and they're trying to do it by sea. So we stop them at the border with — and, frankly, with the help of Mexico. Mexico right now has 27,000 soldiers on our southern border. They never had any soldiers. They're doing that because I've asked them to do it. That's the only reason they're doing it. They have 27,000 soldiers. So now they're trying to bring it in by boat and by ship, the drug lords and the people doing drugs and trying to destroy our country from inside with drugs. And we're hitting them very, very hard. And that's why we're doing it. Are activities that U.S. assets are targeting? Or Say it. Is it beyond narcotics? Are there other illicit activities that well, U.S. Well, there, are, there are the activities of human trafficking, uh, and especially with respect to women. Uh, and uh, as you know, proportionally, it's mostly women. Uh, and it's oh, a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. And there's never been a time like it. And it's because of the Internet. And this is all over the world. But for the most part, they're coming through — in this country, they're coming through the southern border. But we're hitting them very hard. They have uh, tremendous illegal trafficking in women and children uh, also, but mostly in women. And it's illegal, and it's horrible, and it's disgraceful. And I've seen things that are an absolute disgrace. And we're trying to knock them out, and we're knocking them hard. And again, I want to thank the President of Mexico, because uh, he has really stepped up to the plate. 27,000 soldiers. They've never had any soldiers on our border. And I did that because the Democrats will not approve anything to stop, because they want to have open borders. They want to have all these people flowing through our border. And in many cases, they're sick. Uh, they have problems that we, you don't want to know about. Or they're criminals in many cases. Not in all cases, but in many cases. And they don't want to have — they want to have open borders. They want to have sanctuary cities. So they protect criminals. And I don't want to have it. And Joe Biden does want to have that also, as you know, because he said that during numerous debates. I want to have strong borders. And I don't like protecting criminals with sanctuary cities. But we're doing it for drugs. We're doing it for human trafficking. We're doing it because you have to do it. We either have borders or we don't have a country. All right, go ahead, Mr. President, the question of antibody testing, uh, which is FDA approved now but not widely available yet. I know the Admiral said by May right. expect to have millions uh, available. How are you going to prioritize who's going to get the antibody tests, and what does what is that going to show you? Do you think okay. that's going to be immunity? I mean, I have an answer, but I'd rather have the Admiral answer that. So uh, let me clarify, and I know you probably understand this, is the antibody test does not tell you if you have the active virus in your nose. If you're positive for the antibody, it strongly implies, it means, that you have had the virus before. Uh, and to the degree that we know of medical knowledge, you will probably, highly probably, be protected against getting the virus again in the future. So I want to make something clear. Um, there's no antibody test a approved, okay? Approved is not a word we talk about. There is a test or two that has received emergency use authorization and many, many, many others out there that have not gone that way yet. And I want to take this opportunity to caution. Um, there is a very uh, consolidated effort between the FDA, CDC, NIH to validate some of the tests that are on the market right now because it is very important that they actually do what they say they do. Um, and, and we have reason to believe that not all of them are going to perform well. I don't know the primary source, but the Financial Times just reported that the U.K. had 17.5 million antibody tests that they bought, and none of them work. So we're not going to get in that situation. We're going to be very careful to make sure that when we tell you you're likely immune from the disease, you're really — that test really said that. Now, I will also make a statement, and I'm, uh, there's a lot of work on here, and I'm very excited about it. As opposed to the test for a novel virus, the antibody-type tests are, are, are very sophisticated technology, but they're old technology. This we expect to have many tens of millions of tests the first month that we are really sure that the test makes sense. So this, this allows for surveillance uh, screening, and Dr. Burks is one of the world experts to understand 
is 1%, 5%, 20% of Americans have been infected. But it also allows us to have very widespread tens and tens of millions of people screened with a finger prick on the spot. By when, just to be, by May you're saying this will happen? Or so so we are, science doesn't run on rails, right? So we need to make sure that the FDA, the NIH, which they're actively doing right now, assure that the tests that they're testing really do perform the way they should. Um, and if things work out the way we believe they will, we will have millions on the market by May in a sophisticated way, in a prospective way, that we get the surveillance we need. We can test people um, to see if they've been exposed, immune, and go back to work. And a combination of that kind of test with the current kind of test we have now is how America opens back up. And how do you prioritize who gets those tests? I mean, tens of million, we're a country of 300 million. How do you determine who you're going to have, have that test? Well, we are having active discussions under the leadership of Dr. Burks and the task force, but you can imagine how that is, right? But with tens and tens and tens of millions of tests per month that are available, you could really do wide, very widespread testing. But let me just give you an example. Which nobody else can do, by the way. No other country can do. I'll just give you one example. It would be very important to know if the virus is still circulating here, whether, for example, a healthcare worker or a long-term care nursing home worker is immune from the virus and can't carry it. Very, very important to protect our elderly um, in that situation. But also, if you haven't been exposed, to make sure that you really take precautions and maybe take care of the people who don't have the virus and you don't have the virus. So they're very, it's complex, but it's not complicated on how you go about looking this in different uh, segments of society. And I don't want to take too much more time at the podium, but antibody tests are a different thing. Uh, they're coming. We're highly confident that this can be scaled very rapidly uh, and, and provide us a bit of information we just don't have now. Jessica? Mr. President, may I follow up on what you A few more. We'll do a few more. May I, and then Mike is taking over, and you're going to see some incredible work that's been done. Go ahead, please. May I please follow up on what you said with regard to uh, Captain Crozier before? You said yes. you didn't want to uh, punish him for having a bad day. He had a bad day or a bad, bad week. Would, does that but mean? I, I don't. Yeah, I want to. I'm going to look into it. And I, yeah. I also, I also think our Navy Secretary is highly respected man. So sometimes that happens with people, and uh, I'll, I'll take a look at it. But what, is, what do you mean by that? Would you consider reinstating well, a bad day him? when he sends a letter out? And he sends copies all over the place, and it's not a classified letter. And it was very disconcerting to the families of the people on the ship, very disconcerting. So, number one, they get worried and scared. It was weak. We don't want weak. But I'm going to take a look, because he's, I think he, you know, looks to me like he's an outstanding guy. I looked, I looked at his whole, just a little while ago, I looked at his file. And people have bad days, and we'll take a look at it. I guess my question is, what would you consider doing for him? Well, we'll take a look. I want to look. I want to speak also to the secretary. Uh, I also want to speak to Secretary of Defense, who's Mark Esper is doing a fantastic job. And we'll, uh, you know, maybe I can help the situation out. I mean, you guys are saying, why is the president getting involved? And going, well, I like to solve problems. It's a problem, you know. I, I don't want to see men hurt, women hurt. I don't want to see people hurt unnecessarily. Maybe we can solve it easily where, you know, it's not life-changing. But he did He did a bad thing. Sending a letter out and many, many copies, as you know. I don't know. I heard 28 copies. I heard a lot. That's a lot of copies. Plus, the letter was five pages long. I haven't read the letter, but I think it was five pages long, single-spaced. That's a lot of writing. You know, he's the captain of a ship. He's the He's a very important person of a, a very expensive ship. A nuclear-powered ship, he should be writing letters like that. But it happens. Sometimes I'll write a letter that I say, I wish I didn't send it. Not too often, but it happens. Can I follow up on that? Yeah, go ahead. follow up on that? Because the acting Navy Secretary, and I know you were asked about this, but I just want to try one more time. He did say in remarks to soldiers on the USS Roosevelt that Crozier was, quote, too naive or too stupid to be in command if he didn't think that writing well, that letter was Well, I don't want to comment on what he said. I, I understand. Use different language, it's, Mr. it's tough language, but I, I don't want to. Let, let's not get into that. It's tough language. Now, there are some people that think, oh, wow, he says it like it is. Look, he made a mistake. He should not have sent that letter. 
Or he should have gone through his chain of command, which is the typical way of doing it. You know, he's in the military. He's a very important person in the military. He knows it better than anybody in this room what he should have done. And I'm sure he feels he made a mistake. But I'm going to look into it, and I'm going to see maybe we can do something, because I'm not looking to destroy a person's life who's had an otherwise stellar career, as I understand it. I looked at his file just now because I've been seeing what's going on. If we can save, if we can save a person's career, I don't mind going after a person if they did something wrong. And, you know, but this was a mistake. He made a mistake. I'm not justifying what he did. He made a mistake. Shouldn't be sending letters. He's the captain. He's a very important person in the military. You don't send letters, and then it leaks into a newspaper, of all newspapers. That was a beauty, right? So you just don't do that. So it was a mistake. But I may get involved. I'll call uh, Secretary of Defense and find out a little bit about it. And if I can help two people, two good people, I'm going to help them. Sir, on the tone seems to have changed a little bit since Saturday. Say? Your tone seems to have changed a little bit on the captain since Saturday. On the captain? It, yeah, has no, it been has it, news I mean, look, coverage or did okay, somebody ready? speak to you on his behalf? I, I said when you asked me and when the question was asked the last time, I said, he shouldn't have sent the letter. I haven't changed. He should not have sent a letter. And it should have, if there's a letter, it should go classified and it should go to his superior. And he shouldn't be jumping over his superior. Sir, did so I'm, it hasn't you? changed in that regard. The only thing that has uh, played right up here with me is that I looked at his record. And he's been an outstanding person. If he wasn't, I wouldn't even be talking about this. He's been an outstanding person. He's had a very exemplary uh, military career. I mean, you know, he started off as a helicopter pilot. They called him Chopper. His name was Chopper. He was a great helicopter pilot. It's a tremendous skill. I know a lot about helicopters. And then he went to F-16s or F-18s, and he was a tremendous pilot. And then he's very smart. He studied nuclear energy, and he was fantastic. And very few people have the aptitude, they have the mentality to do that. Nuclear energy is very complex, very, it's very hard. Very few people can do it. And he did it well. And then he became the captain of a nuclear ship, right? He became of a, if a replacement course, if you look at replacement cost, $18 billion a replacement cost, right? So he's got, on a replacement cost basis, an $18 billion ship. You know, the President Gerald Ford, very expensive. That's, you know, the nearest thing I can think of. But they're spending money on that one like nobody's ever seen. So he made a mistake. He made a mistake. And maybe we're going to make that mistake not destroy his life. Okay, a couple of more. You mentioned medical professionals. You compared them to soldiers going onto the battlefield. Yeah. Uh, many doctors and medical workers today, uh, some that see pay cuts, they're going into a, a certain environment where they're concerned about their own health, their families, uh, livelihood, uh, if something were to happen to them. Very much in my mind. As part of this phase four, are you going to prioritize? It doesn't have to be phase four. I think it could be a separate phase when it's all over. Right now, I don't think they want to think about it. These people don't want to think about it. These people are incredible. They're not thinking about how much am I getting paid. These people are incredible. I've seen it. I see the spirit. I hear about it all the time. From Mike, from the Admiral, I hear about it all the time. These people are incredible. When it's all over, I do want to seriously think, maybe in the form of bonuses. These people are, what they've done is incredible. I just, I just admire the attitude, and I've said it. I just, they walk into those hospitals and they are seriously, you know, one of the things that came up with the comfort, the ship, is that when we, we fulfilled the request of Governor Cuomo and Governor Murphy, uh, and uh, they're going to be splitting up, but, you know, a lot of things happen to ships when you do that. You know, it's a lot of, they didn't want to do this. In fact, they specifically didn't want to do this. Have patients that were affected with this horrible disease or whatever, the plague, because, frankly, it's a plague. That's exactly what it is. You'd read about it in the old days, the plague, and that's exactly what it is. Uh, but we're doing it. But when I see the bravery of these people walking through doors without their stuff, I mean, they're half, they're just getting, they're not standing outside, hey, let's get ready, let's, they're running through doors, putting on the stuff that's not even on. I think it's incredible. I, I'm telling you, the nearest thing I can think of is soldiers in battle and soldiers going right into battle, because that's what they're doing. 
It's really, in many ways, it's the same thing. All right, Mr. how about President, one more? Sir, one question, Mr. President. Uh, you may have seen this. Uh, the Masters Tournament has been rescheduled to November. Two questions. A, is that an outgrowth of your conversation that you had with sports commissioners on Saturday? I hope Saturday? it's rescheduled. I hope, I hope football's yeah. able to start. I hope yeah. baseball can get to play a little bit. I hope basketball can maybe do their playoffs. I mean, hey, I have no I have no interests or anything other than I want what's good for the country. What about the U.S. A lot Open, of people are tired. Many times. Yeah, a lot of people are tired of looking at games that are five years old. I looked the other day. I saw somebody. I said, wow, he looks great. I forgot. I said, oh, that was nine years ago. I said, he's really in great shape. Well, not in great shape now, but he was in great shape then. It was nine years ago. You know, you get tired of looking at nine-year-old baseball games and in playoff games that took place 12 years ago. I don't have much time to do that, frankly, but that's what people are doing. And they want to see sports. Sports are a great thing for this country. And I hope football can start. And I told them, I think you might be able to. They may very well be able to. I hope they can start. And I hope they can start with people in the stands. You know, we're not going to be separated. You have seats. Those seats are meant for people to sit next to each other. And when this virus is gone, people are going to be sitting next to each other. And just for the restaurant industry, so they understand, when the virus is gone, people are going to be sitting next to each other. One man said, I have a 200-seat restaurant. It's been great. But if I go by these rules, this 200 seats goes down to 60. I said, no, no. You have a 200-seat restaurant. That's what you have. But we have to wait till the virus goes away. It wouldn't even do well at 60. Frankly, there's a warmth to it also. There's a warmth. But not when we have the virus in the air. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. So I'm going to let our vice president take over. He's got some really uh, interesting uh, numbers, statistics. And I want to thank the admiral. I want to thank uh, Tony and Deborah and everybody else. I want to thank everybody that's working. And I, I really do. I see a lot of tremendous things happen. The therapeutics, the call I had today was one of the most exciting calls I've had in a long time. And again, I want to wish my best to uh, the UK and uh, the family of Boris Johnson, and we just hope he's going to be okay because he's he's a fine guy. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. A few updates on the activity of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Then I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Burks to speak about uh, what we're seeing in the numbers. Uh, we know we are at the beginning of what's going to be a very tough week in America. But as Dr. Burks will reflect, because the American people have been embracing social distancing, putting into practice the advice of state and local leaders and the president's coronavirus guidelines uh, for our country, as Dr. Burks uh, will describe, we are uh, not only seeing uh, remarkable progress in Washington State and in California, where the numbers remain low and steady. That's a great tribute to the people of both of those states and to all of their dedicated health care workers. But we're also beginning, uh, we're beginning to see a leveling uh, just at the very beginning. Um, and she'll reflect on those in just a few moments. Um, and a couple of quick updates. Um, at the present moment, the President has approved 50 major disaster declarations, and we'll likely be issuing a disaster declaration for the state of Minnesota before the end of the day. We've distributed more than $4.1 billion to states, and um, right after our incredible health care workers, we couldn't be more proud of more than 21,000 National Guard uh, that have been activated um, and, and are, are working in states uh, all across the country. Uh, during my conference call today, I, I learned that uh, Governor Brian Kemp is actually using the Georgia National Guard to sanitize and clean up nursing homes. But National Guard are being deployed in a variety of ways all across uh, the country. And uh, to them and to the families of all these citizen soldiers, you have our admiration and our respect. Uh, as, as the President mentioned, our focus remains on the New York metro area, New Jersey, uh, Louisiana, and then Michigan and Illinois. We're watching every area of the country, but those are the priorities today. Uh, and uh, in that spirit, uh, I spoke today, as the President did, with uh, Governor Cuomo of New York. 
the president made the decision to open up uh, the USNS Comfort uh, to COVID patients. Uh, and he also informed the governor of New Jersey that we would be taking New Jersey COVID patients. So now there will be two facilities, one at the Javits Center that's all COVID and uh, in the USNS Comfort that will be managing uh, COVID uh, patients. Uh, at the present moment, uh, there by this evening, there will be uh, 2,179 uh, medical military personnel in New York City. And over the next two days, that number will rise to 3,000. Speaking with the governor, speaking with Mayor de Blasio, the president and I were informed that uh, while we have surged ventilators, we have surged uh, personal protective equipment, uh, that sending in some relief for health care workers was vitally important. And so, again, I want to emphasize that, um, that uh, those are medical personnel, doctors and nurses and medical assistants uh, who uh, are on the scene now and will continue to arrive to a total number of 3,000. Um, uh, I spoke to uh, Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey. New Jersey is very much in the forefront uh, of the coronavirus in America today. We want to want to commend the governor for his extraordinary uh, leadership in the state. Uh, during our briefing today, uh, we learned about the progress that they were making uh, and uh, also about the governor's decision to uh, temporarily reactivate uh, retired health care personnel uh, in the state. And just as a reminder of, of all that we're dealing with, this weekend, Governor Murphy told me that New Jersey surpassed the number of lives that were lost on September 11th to the state of New Jersey. And uh, it, it breaks our heart uh, to think of that. And our, our hearts go out to all of the families of the more than 10,000 Americans who have succumbed uh, to the coronavirus. Um, we also, as the president said, we express our gratitude uh, to governors uh, in, in Oregon and Washington State yesterday for uh, for donating ventilators uh, to help uh, the states at the epicenter of uh, the coronavirus. Uh, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom of uh, California donated 500 ventilators. Uh, and uh, I just learned that uh, those will be going 200 to the state of Maryland, uh, 50 to the District of Columbia, 100 to the state of Delaware, 100 to Nevada, and we'll also be deploying uh, the remaining 50 uh, to the Northern Marianas Islands and uh, to Guam. And we want to thank uh, Governor Gavin Newsom. The state of California has provided extraordinary and compassionate leadership for their citizens. Uh, they're making progress. They're, as the governor said the other day, they're not out of the woods yet, but the numbers uh, speak for themselves and the generosity of the people of California and the governor is gratefully uh, received. Um, Beyond that, before I recognize uh, Dr. Burks, let me um, let me just say that um, uh, at the beginning of this challenging time, uh, we want to we want to challenge every American to continue to do what every American can do. And clearly, what we see in Washington and California, and what we are just beginning to see elsewhere, um, is put into practice the social distancing. Uh, recommendations of the coronavirus guidelines for America. Listen to your state and local authorities. Uh, we really do believe that, it, that while this will be a week of heartache, um, it also is a week of hope. And as we see some of the cases beginning to level just for a day or two, it is our hope that what we have seen begin in the greater New York area and even in Louisiana and elsewhere will become a trend. But it only becomes a trend if every one of us continues to take ownership and continues to do our part for this 30 days to slow the spread. Uh, with that, I'll recognize Dr. Burks for the latest data, and then we'll take questions. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Um, I think you heard very clearly our concern in the New York, New Jersey metro areas. This also includes Connecticut and Long Island. Um, as we talked about, we did see a significant increase in Sussex County over the weekend. 
Um, the weekend numbers are always difficult. I want to be clear on that because sometimes case reporting is not as accurate over the weekend. So we'll be watching very closely today's numbers and Tuesday's numbers. We're also very course focused on the New Orleans metro area, and that includes the three parishes of Jefferson, St. John's the Baptist, and New Orleans proper, and of course the Detroit area, um, which is Oakland and Wayne. Um, as we mentioned before, we're continuing to track very closely out of concerns of it potentially reaching logarithmic phase in the Chicago metro area, the Boston metro area, the DC and Baltimore metro area, Indianapolis, um, the Denver area, and two regions of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia and the Pittsburgh area, as well as Dallas and Houston in the Texas area. I had a very encouraging call because we also don't want to miss anything. Remember, I showed you a lot of states were very much under 25 and 50 cases for 100,000. There were some a few standouts that we were concerned about, which was Vermont, New Hampshire, Idaho, and Montana. We had excellent calls today with their health commissioners, and they um, really were able, they're on top of the situation. These were... Um, micro outbreaks that occurred um, due to ski events and weddings and nursing homes and they were able to describe in critical detail the um, incidents and how they're tracking and tracing. So they are still doing full contact tracing through those areas and I just want to applaud um, these. This, so both a rural and metro problem and I really want to applaud um, how many of the states that may have smaller populations are approaching this. That gives us encouragement of how we can talk about beginning surveillance activities at the same time we're following these very clear outbreaks and ensuring that there's full supplies based on the very granular data that we're utilizing and I just want to thank the mayors and governors who get us that granular data and allow us to make these deep interpretations across all of the United States. We know each governor is concerned about their areas, but these metro areas cover different areas. So the Philadelphia area also includes southern New Jersey and um, Delaware. And so we have to really look at things very much as both the metro and the communities that surround those, those metros. And so all of those people, we ask you again um, throughout the United States to follow these very clear guidance. I want to just recognize both HHS, and you heard about the, uh, the work that Admiral Girard is doing, the work that Dr. Hahn and Administrator Seema Varma, uh, Verma are doing, and also Administrator Engels in the work of HRSA to really ensure that our federally funded clinics are actively engaged in all of these aspects. But I also want to recognize the military, the medical corps, the nursing corps, and the medical subspecialty corps. These were my brothers and sisters for 29 years. It is highly unusual for the active force to be called into a domestic situation. I think that shows you how seriously we're taking this at the federal government level. In my 29 years in the military, I was never deployed domestically. So this is um, showing you how serious of an event we take this. If the military is deploying domestically, it is another reason for every American to be following these guidelines. Finally, um, CDC quietly launched a new website. It's um, you go to cdc.gov and you go to COVID-19, um, you can find their surveillance data. This surveillance data is bringing together our influenza-like illnesses with their syndromic management databases so that you can track the respiratory disease across the United States. The states are used to using this system. It's in emergency rooms, it's in hospitals, it's in doctor's offices, and it gives you insight and you can see very clearly influenza A peak, you can see the influenza B peak, and now you can start to see the respiratory disease from this current outbreak. These are the systems that exist within the United States that will be strengthened in order for us to do comprehensive surveillance. So I just want to assure the American people, while we're working on these outbreaks, we're also working on bringing new systems together that have a comprehensive look across the country, building on the strong work of CDC as a public health institution so that we can work county by county, community by community, state by state to really understand where this virus is and where it will be,
but also as an early alert for us in the future. So I just want to assure the American people that as we're working on the crisis of today, we're looking to the future to ensure we have the systems in place to bring those early alert systems together while we work on the antibody testing and while we work on continuing spreading and increasing the diagnostic capabilities that you see presented here. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Um, and uh, Admiral Giroir uh, spoke several times when the president was with us, so he'll be here for questions as Deborah Burks will. But Dr. Dr. Fauci, your thoughts, and then we'll we'll take some questions. No, no, actually. Okay, I just wanted to. Uh, okay, I will. <laughs> um, it related to the something I said yesterday about uh, that somewhat paradox of everything going up at the same time that the feeding into this engine of this virus is starting to show some signs. So Governor Cuomo today reported an interesting uh, data from New York, namely that the number of hospitalizations, the number of admissions to intensive care, and the number of requirements for intubations over the last three days have actually started to level off. So again, everybody who knows me knows I'm very conservative about making projections, but those are the kind of good signs that you look for, you never even begin to think about claiming victory prematurely, but that's the first thing you see when you start to see the turnaround. That doesn't mean we don't have a lot of work to do. That tells me, instead of saying, hmm, that's pretty good, it's we got there through mitigation. We cut off the stream of people who ultimately required hospitalization, required intubation, required all of the kinds of extreme methods. So we just got to realize that this is an indication, despite all the suffering and the, and, and the death that has occurred, that what we have been doing has been working. So the call that I say every time I get to this podium is just keep it up, because this is going to get us out of it. This is our best and only great public health tool. We're starting to see that across many states. Uh, we're seeing uh, the, 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 the level of hospitalizations and deaths is lower than what we anticipated. Well, you're going to see it most dramatically, John, in a place like New York where you see it goes up and peak, and then it will hopefully, and I think it will, come down. When you have places like Seattle which did a, and Washington State, who did a really good job from the beginning, it, it never really did that, so they were able to keep it down. And, and on, the, on the charts that Dr. Burke showed, when you saw California and Washington State, they were fortunate, they did a good job, that it never really got out of hand. So again, this is a big country, and you have a number of different metropolitan areas. I think if we do it right, you're going to see those who have not peaked will not peak, and those who have peaked the New Orleans, the New York, New Jersey, Chicago, Detroit, and others, you're going to see the same thing if we keep our foot on the accelerator. All right, Matthew. Question. Uh, further questions for the team? Actually, uh, sir, um, yeah, so, okay. I'm just uh, following up Dr. Fauci's comment earlier about what, it, what, it, like, what it's like going to be coming back to normal and until there's a vaccine, that there'll be gradual steps towards yeah. restoring normalcy. Yeah. Under that, you know, short of a vaccine, does putting 80,000 people, fans, uh, spectators in a, in a sports stadium or 25,000 uh, politicos in, a, in an arena for a political convention this summer make a lot of sense because th those sorts of things require a vaccine to fully protect the American populace. No, I don't think that you're going to have to say that the country cannot get back to a real degree of no normalcy until you absolutely have a safe and effective vaccine. It will be really evaluating the kinds of things, and that's the reason why it was discussed up here, why it's so important to have an antibody test so you know what the penetrance is in society. And then we have a situation where we don't ever want to get to have to mitigate. We want it to be able to, to contain. And by the time we have to face what's going to happen with, a, with this going back to normality, we will have in place the capability of identifying, isolating, contact tracing so that it never gets out of hand. Ultimately, the showstopper will be obviously a vaccine where you can vaccinate people and you won't have it. There's going to be another issue that's going to be important, and it has to do with somewhat of a comparison, for example, with influenza. We go through multiple cycles of influenza. There's always a degree of background immunity in the population. I mean, that will ultimately happen 
if we get a situation where we get back to normal. Now, I hope we don't have so many people infected that we actually have that herd immunity. But I think it would have to be different than it is right now. So again, remember when you say normalcy, I mean, we could get back normally economically and otherwise without necessarily saying we're going to forget about the virus. We have to pay attention to this because we've had a very bad experience with this virus. Thank you, and this is for the Vice President, for Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci, but can, can you give us a sense of, and I know you don't want to make any projections, but where we are with the numbers, because um, mm -hmm. we saw that horrible number today, more than 10,000 deaths now in the U.S. Are we on track for the, those best case scenario numbers that you had laid out, the 100,000? Or are we potentially coming in lower than that at this point, given some of what you're seeing? You know, it just gives me an opportunity to thank and respect the modelers who have really worked on this, because there's there's a large number of them have worked very hard um, and did done a lot of predictions. And what we did is did, we did predictions of predictions. We like to integrate data, and so that's where you come up with these numbers. I think Dr. Fauci and I both strongly believe that if we work as hard as we can over the next several weeks, that we will see potential to go under the numbers that were predicted by the models. And I think that is really two things. It is the extraordinary compliance of the American people and the diligence that they have um, mitigated with. Because remember, we are doing this strictly by behavior change. It's very hard to change trajectory of viruses on just behavior change. We have had difficulty in our past doing that. Um, so that's what we're doing, and that's what the American people are doing. But the other side of that is the incredible insights that Washington State and others are providing on how to better care for the patients in the hospital. And so those two pieces are coming together that could have a dramatic impact on the predictions of the mortality from this disease. So I'm glad you asked that question because I, I've said it a couple of times here. I want to say it again. Repetition is good. <laughs> is that models are good. They, they, they help us to make projections. But as you get data in, you modify your model. And I've always said, data always trumps models, always. So what I feel, and I believe that Dr. Burks also feels, that I don't think anyone has ever mitigated the way I'm seeing people mitigate right now. This has never happened in this country before. So I am optimistic, always cautiously optimistic, that if we do what I've been talking about over the past few minutes, we can make that number go down. I, I don't accept every day that we're going to have to have 100 to 200,000 deaths. I think we can really bring that down, no matter what a model says. Because when the data comes in, it'll start to say, you know, maybe you are essentially overshooting the model. And I think that's where we can go. That's the reason why I like to always get up and tell the American people, it's the virus doing what the virus wants to do, and it's we as a society doing what we can do. And, and let me just amplify that from a layperson's perspective. And the American people are doing it. I mean, the, the initial data, what we've seen in California and Washington, support the fact that the American people are doing these things, which is nothing short of loving your neighbor. I mean, the truth is, the threat of serious illness for most Americans is relatively low. But the threat of serious illness for seniors with, with underlying health conditions or anyone with an immunodeficiency is very high. And when, when we see Americans putting these principles into practice the way you all have been, it, it really means you're considering others more important than yourself. And I, and I have to tell you, uh, for the president, for me, for all of us, it's deeply inspiring. Uh, we, ju we just need to continue to do it for all of these 30 days, and we'll bring that number down. Uh, how about a couple more, please? So, Mr. Vice President, when will you know, when do you think that you will know whether or not you will have to extend those 30-day guidelines? will be enough? Well, the, 
The experts told us that somewhere around the middle of this month would be the peak. Uh, and as we begin to see a couple of days that might be the beginning uh, of, of leveling, we're going we're gonna to watch that carefully and we're going to bring that information uh, to the president. But for now, the decision is, and the request of every American, is to continue to put into practice all of the president's coronavirus guidelines, 30 days to slow the spread. And for all of you in areas uh, that have been impacted broadly by the coronavirus, listen to what your state and local authorities are asking you to do. It will protect your health, your family's health, and it will save lives. Let's do a couple more and uh, for our panel, if you'd like. Jeff. More of a personal question, but uh, Dr. Burst, can you tell us if your granddaughter's okay? And yeah, I'd like yeah. to. Well, thank you. Um, Due to her, the great care of my 91-year-old nurse mother and my daughter, um, she's down to like 100 to 99 now, but it was three days of 104 and 105, which is, you know, babies can do that, but it's very scary, especially when I couldn't assure myself that she was fine. So it was just some sleepless nights for me and them as they kept our fever down. So thank you for asking. Do you have this the virus? Oh, or? no, I'm sure it's rosiola or something. Um, they have not been out of the house. Um, they are not allowed out of the house. Um, <laughs> they've got two granddaughters under one, two and a half almost, and one only 10 months, and my 91-year-old and 96-year-old. So no one is allowed in that house or out of that house, because there's too much precious cargo inside the house. How about, how about one more one more question? We'll let Thank you all. Vice President, uh, for whoever wants to answer this, it's a technical question. So mm -hmm. FEMA says that it is in the process of distributing 90% of each state's allocated supplies for the national strategic stockpile. And that allocation is determined based on population by the last census in each state. And the other 10%, it says, is going to frontline healthcare workers serving in the federal response efforts. So where, where are those healthcare workers in the federal response? And do you envision a scenario in which you could start giving states more supplies from the national strategic stockpile? Uh, you know, it's it's a really good question, and uh, let me say the strategic national stockpile, and I'm going to have Admiral Giroir speak about his piece of that, um, uh, is has been largely um, uh, deployed. We are continuing to replenish it in part with a small portion of what's coming in from around the world. You've heard about our air bridge, now more than 50 flights that have been scheduled that are bringing millions of supplies into the United States. What we're doing is taking less than 10 percent of that, put it into the strategic national stockpile so we have that to basically provide for states uh, uh, on an as-needed basis. But the other 90 percent, uh, that, that system that I just described earlier when the president was here, is working with the six major medical distributors in the country to deploy those resources to New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Louisiana, Michigan, Illinois, the exact priority that you just heard uh, Dr. Burks describe and that the data informs. And those decisions are being made every single day. And so while, while if a hurricane uh, hits uh, uh, Florida uh, or, uh, or tornadoes or flooding tear through the state of Indiana, we're very accustomed to FEMA coming in, drawing from the national stockpile, providing specific resources. In this case, with a nationwide effort, what President Trump directed us to do was literally marshal the resources of the full economy uh, to be able to make sure that we can meet the needs for personal protective equipment, uh, ventilators, uh, and, and all manner of supplies. And we're doing that in, in a small way through the strategic national stockpile, but in the largest way through that control tower system that Admiral John Polovjic is, is running for us that is deploying those resources and, and making sure they're going, going straight to where they need to go. And as I said earlier, those decisions are being informed by the data and they're literally being made by our team at FEMA on a daily and sometimes hourly 
basis. And we'll continue to keep you informed as we did today about where some of those are going. But let me let uh, Admiral Giroir finish that answer. I don't really have much more to add to that. The Vice President is certainly well informed about that. Um, and I want to assure you that all the sourcing around the world, if it's there, we're putting it in our supply chains. We're buying more. Manufacturers are stepping up to the plate. And this is going not just by percent allocation, but it's going to the exact places that need it in the quantities that they need to take care of patients. And we want to make sure um, this is a two-way street. We get the data in from individual hospitals to know exactly what their burn rate is, exactly what they need. And we want to make sure that they feel comfortable that they're going to have supplies because they will. Because part of this is about potential shortages other places, some places. Most of it's about a fear of a shortage. If I'm a physician in an ICU and I'm not sure that it's going to be there, that's going to scare me. It's going to scare my nurses. So we want everyone to have that assurance that we will provide you what you need over weeks, periods of time, exactly to your need. And Admiral Polubchuk and his team, and again, it's all military in there. I mean, he is the logistics guy for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, right? This is what he does. He is a wizard. Um, he has a. I, there are more stars around me. In the, in the DOD part of the military than I've generally seen outside of the Pentagon. This is really being run as a military operation. I'm in the U.S. Public Health Service, so we're part of HHS. The Surgeon General and I have the honor of running that service. We are shoulder to shoulder in the field, in the military hospitals with everyone else. There are only 6,100 of us. 3,000 are doing direct patient care on a daily basis. We take care of the Indian Health Service, the Bureau of Prisons, those in detention at the border, et cetera. That's what we do. The other 3,000, over 2,000 of those are in the field already, taking care of patients directly, and we have more going out the door every day. And, and if I could just follow up on that very quickly then, is it even worth then governors riding into FEMA if they've already received their 90% allocation and you're getting data directly from the hospitals to ask for more at this point? This, is, this has been a very cooperative interaction. I, I bet I talk to five governors a day. And we talk out we talk out the issues and understand what they what they perceive in their state. They often help us help point us to particular areas that may that they feel need more attention or that needs more communication. So it's been very productive. Um, I, I you know I I have to look up what governor goes to what state because I'm not that's not my world. But uh, but it's been a very productive interaction. So I think all of this is necessary. I'm on almost every governor's call with the vice president. They're very meaningful, uh, they're impactful, they're informative, they're communicative. Uh, we talk to each other, but then we do get down to the individual hospital level because when the rubber meets the road, you got to know what the docs, nurses, respiratory therapists, the people who clean the rooms are an important part of the team. I want them to come to every work saying, you know, it's not that I cleaned a room, I'm saving lives today. And they are saving lives by keeping uh, the viruses off the surfaces and reducing transmission. So you've really got to get that granular, and we're to a point with Admiral P's. You have two admirals with the worst pronounced names in the world, so Admiral P, Admiral G, but Admiral P's team really has this covered down to the individual hospital. Thank you, sir. Let me say just by way of closing, because I thought, I thought that last question was helpful. Um, we're interacting with governors every day, seven days a week, uh, and, and we welcome that. And while there are some resources in Strategic National Reserve, we spoke about ventilators. We have some 9,000 ventilators on standby. Um, uh, we also have this vast array through the commercial system that when we hear from governors, we're identifying the needs. They're working every day to identify their hospital capacity. We went over governors today saying we need to know we need to know what your capacity is, what your normal capacity is, what your surge capacity is. We need to understand um, what what your equipment uh, complement is across the state. And governors have been doing this. They've been assembling that information. But I, I, I want to tell you, the governors across this country in both political parties have been doing a remarkable job. Um, and the president's grateful, and I'm grateful. And I, I just want to know that those health care workers that they're serving uh, and the families that those healthcare workers are serving uh, can be confident that we are going to do whatever it takes to get them what they need when they need it. And every governor is working in that regard. Every hospital administrator is working in that regard. And the opportunity that, that we have, because the American people are stepping up so strongly, 
uh, and, and putting others ahead of themselves. They're, in most cases, they're, uh, they're, they're acting in a way uh, that, that puts the health of others first. Uh, we're, we're more confident today than ever before that we're going to be able to provide our health care providers and the states that are impacted with the coronavirus with the resources and the support they need uh, to meet this moment. And we're just going to continue to work our hearts out um, and, uh, and make that a reality. You know, I, but I have to end with just a reference to the health care workers. I, uh, you've heard these doctors talk about them. They're all health care people. Mm -hmm for the president talk about them, you all have seen them. And uh, uh, to think what, what these healthcare workers, doctors and nurses and medical assistants are doing every day, uh, it inspires us uh, to get up early, to stay up late, to keep working, to make sure they have what they need to be able to continue to do their job courageously. Um, and I, I know I speak on behalf of, uh, of every American when I say how grateful we are for each and every one of you. And. Um, uh, and in this very special Holy Week, uh, I know millions of Americans are praying for our health care workers. Um, I saw a picture that I, I sent out uh, last night on, on Twitter. It was an article about a series of cities where doctors and nurses had paused to pray for the patients and the families that they were ministering to. And I just want to say to all those health care workers, I know there is a chorus of prayer going up every day for all of you uh, and with your continued courageous service uh, and with God's help. We'll get through this and we'll get through it together. Thank you all. All right, we have been watching a briefing from members of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, a briefing that lasted more than two hours. From public health officials first, we heard from Dr. Anthony Fauci, who said, among other things, that looking at the data from New York, specifically the leveling off, at least for now, of new hospitalizations, he said that suggests that the mitigation steps are working. He said, we got there through mitigation, quote, this is going to get us out of it referring to the coronavirus crisis. He was also asked about the notion of the country returning to some kind of normality in the future. And Dr. Fauci said, quote, if, be, if back to normal means acting like there never was a coronavirus problem, I don't think that's going to happen until we do have a situation where you can completely protect the population. Dr. Deborah Burks was asked about remarks that she made in a recent briefing when she said that now is not the time for people to necessarily go out to the grocery store or to the pharmacy. What she said today was that if you can send one person, the entire family does not need to go out uh, on these kinds of occasions to the grocery store, to the pharmacy. She said this is a highly transmittable virus. Maybe once every two weeks you can do a pharmacy and grocery store shop for the whole family. Um, but there were a number of other statements made by President Trump. And for that, let's go ahead and bring in our CBSN political reporter, Caitlin Huey Burns, to help us sort through what was said uh, by officials, including the president. Um, Caitlin, I know you've been listening and watching along with us here uh, another lengthy briefing that started with the president. Um, I want to first ask you about a line of questioning, Caitlin, that the president clearly did not like. When reporters tried to ask about an HHS uh, Health and Human Services Inspector General's report that found American hospitals are dealing with severe shortages of medical supplies, also found issues uh, with testing. The president went after reporters who tried to ask about that Inspector General's report and did not necessarily address the substance of those questions. Uh, what more can you tell us about what the president had to say about that? Yes, he's been very dismissive of any criticism of his administration's handling of coronavirus and especially of this issue of testing. The inspector general's report uh, was taken at the end of March and it found a variety of issues that these hospitals and these medical workers at the front lines are facing. And one of those issues uh, is the either lack of testing or the amount of time it takes to get testing done and get it back to people and to to be able to uh, show who should be quarantined, 
who should be taking, uh, who they should be taking in, who has uh, tested positive. So these issues of testing have been really critical. And we've heard that from medical workers. We've also heard that from governors earlier on, saying that the lack of testing really makes it difficult to make any sorts of uh, longer term decisions and decisions about care and uh, decisions revolving the, uh, involving the economy. Uh, so this was a really critical point because this inspector general's report outlined a variety of different issues that these hospitals are facing. At CBS, we've all been covering these issues as well. You could see uh, on CBS this morning, earlier today, going inside uh, a hospital and these uh, medical professionals telling uh, um, reporter David Begno that they didn't have the supplies that they needed. They were wearing, um, you know, equipment that wasn't uh, official protective equipment, and we keep hearing this line. But the president seemed to just kind of hark on, um, pick up on that uh, word inspector general and just immediately uh, kind of dismisses it. The inspector general was appointed um, by his administration. Uh, she has been serving in, uh, the IG's office uh, since 1999, so across a variety of different presidents and administrations. Uh, and so it was, it was interesting to see him go after her, trying to attach her to the Obama administration when she was actually appointed during his tenure. Uh, but what uh, her report found was that there are these there are these issues in these hospitals there have been these issues with testing uh, and this is something that's been uh, borne out in reporting uh, I also want to ask Caitlin about uh, the president's remarks at the top of the briefing where he sent his best wishes to British Prime Minister Boris Johnson who was diagnosed with the coronavirus is now in the intensive care unit the president said that Americans are all praying for his recovery. He's been a really good friend. Interestingly, Caitlin, uh, Zeke Miller, Associated Press White House reporter and a CBSN political contributor, asked whether or not the diagnosis and now the subsequent uh, placing in intensive care of Prime Minister Johnson has affected in any way the approach that the president and the vice president and others are taking with respect to how they are governing this country. Tell us a little bit about what we heard from the president. It's an interesting question because, as you've seen in those briefings, um, they are there together at the same time during these briefings. The president usually speaks first and then uh, Mike Pence speaks, uh, but they are together along with their medical professionals. Uh, the president talked about his relationship with Boris Johnson. They're uh, friendly. Uh, they have a lot in common, actually. Um, and so I think you saw the idea that um, Prime Minister Johnson was now in intensive care really struck the president. Um, he said over and over again that, that this is a really, really big deal, that this is a really tough uh, thing that he is going through. Uh, and I think that kind of had a uh, jarring type of nature, and you could kind of hear him uh, feel that. But there is this question uh, about, you know, how this hits home. Uh, the president and the vice president have been uh, tested, the president twice uh, for coronavirus, tested negative. Um, you uh, see from these uh, medical professionals, too, that they've been tested. Dr. Fauci has been recently tested negative, um, trying to ensure these protocols, the White House press corps has been sitting uh, in a socially distant fashion, having a rotating uh, pool of reporters going in to maintain that social distance. Uh, so this is something that I think is really hitting home uh, for uh, the administration and uh, for those who cover it. And also hearing the news from Boris Johnson today, uh, you know, this, this virus, as many have said, does not discriminate in that way. Finally, Caitlin, before we let you go, I just want to get your thoughts on uh, what the president said today with respect to former Vice President Joe Biden. Um, you know, this is an administration, the current one, that has been quite critical, the president has been, of the Obama administration's handling of uh, crises like H1N1. Um, but what is it that we heard today? This is an interesting uh, conversation that took place. 
That's right. He's been very critical of the Obama administration, and he has referred to Joe Biden several times from that podium as Sleepy Joe Biden. That's his nickname for him. Uh, so it was really remarkable that these two men spoke today. Uh, the coronavirus, like everything in public life, has really upended the, the presidential campaign. Joe Biden has been uh, in his Wilmington home for about a month now, hunkered down, trying to figure out ways to uh, talk and engage to and engage supporters. And one of those ways is that he has said that he is coming up with uh, strategies, that he wanted to share those with the president and the White House. Uh, and so today, the two men spoke. And uh, the president called Joe Biden a really nice guy. He said they had a very warm conversation, that he really enjoyed the conversation, that it was about 15 minutes long. He said Joe Biden offered some advice. And Trump said, it's not, I might not. I probably, you know, I, I might not consider that advice, but that's that's what he offered. Uh, and they didn't really get into details of those conversations. The Biden campaign didn't get into details either. Uh, but this was kind of a significant moment because the two are poised to be uh, rivals this November. Uh, Joe Biden uh, hasn't yet clinched the nomination outright, but he is certainly headed uh, on that path and is likely the Democratic nominee. And this comes as both Democrats and Republicans are trying to figure out what the November election might actually look like, if there can be uh, in-person voting. Democrats have been calling for mail-in ballots or an expansion of that in November. And of course, uh, Wisconsin's um, is supposed to hold an election tomorrow, and that is uh, in a muddled state uh, as well. So interesting that the two men spoke. The president had very kind words for Joe Biden. I don't anticipate that that kind of tone will remain uh, throughout the coming days and through this campaign, but an effort uh, by both to, to talk and an effort by the Biden uh, campaign to show that they are working on this issue uh, and want to be helpful in some way. So we'll see if that lasts as well. All right. So much uncertainty on so many levels. Caitlin Huey Burns for us. Caitlin, terrific to see you. Thank you so much. Take care. And we are going to take a quick break. More news for you straight ahead. Stay with us. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on. Watch CBSN 24 7. We've got an amazing story to share with you. Let's talk about the latest developments. There's so many levels to this. We have a CBS News exclusive. Fires in California. What happens next and how does it all play out? We are on a mission with NASA. I understand you have some breaking news. It's not over yet, is the bottom line. This is a massive operation. It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. Telling the whole story means going where the story is. How did you get rescued? Listening when people are hurting. Sorry. Getting to the heart of what matters. Wow. That's who Nora is. That's what Nora does. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell from Washington, D.C. something so fascinating about watching suspected criminals mm -hmm. kind of at work. Technology that tracks our every move is designed to help us make better decisions. The arrest will go into the database. All that data will be collected that it was drug related. For police, artificial intelligence promises to help reduce crime and eliminate racial bias that has long plagued law enforcement. Crime has been reduced well over 20 percent. Predictive policing is part of that success. But is data-driven policing truly colorblind? There's always a reason in the car to pull over. There's always something wrong. Or is it unwittingly supercharging racial bias? If you unthinkingly develop a data-driven policing system based on past police practices, you're kind of going to reify past police practices. We say no to these programs, and we say no to data-driven policing. Whenever we 
we walk out in our apartment building, they're coming inside harassing us, even my 11-year-old son. Sophia's a mother of three boys, and her middle child was just arrested for a robbery she says he couldn't have committed because he was with family at the time. His case is now pending in juvenile court. Never, he played Fortnite, the video game. That's what he do. He don't go outside, he don't hang out or anything. <laughs> The Los Angeles Police Department patrols a population of over 4 million people in a city with a crime rate that's 17 percent above the national average. More than twice as many arrests per square mile occur in a relatively small section of the city known as South LA. This is one of the most heavily policed parts of Los Angeles. The police station is here. I've already counted like nine bail bond storefronts. The LAPD has a history of disproportionately targeting minority communities like this one, where nearly all of the residents, about 98%, are people of color. A 2008 study by researchers at Yale Law School revealed that for every 10,000 residents in Los Angeles, 3,400 more black people are stopped than white people, and when stopped, blacks are 127% more likely to be frisked than whites. That's despite the fact that frisked black people were 42% less likely to be found with a weapon, and when consensually searched, were 24% less likely to be found with drugs. The same study also found significant discrepancies between how police treated white versus Hispanic residents. You know, I started getting in trouble. I was first arrested like at 12 or 13 years old. And then I ended up catching a felony and like doing jail time. What's up, everybody? Today we're gonna to be talking about um, like know your rights. Anthony Robles is a formerly incarcerated youth turned community leader. He works with young people in the area on civil rights training and racial profiling. Fit the description is a common thing they use. How many people have been told they fit the description by a cop? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Almost all of us, right? Do you still get stopped? Yeah, not as frequently as before, but yeah. I was stopped in an Uber as a passenger. So I got in my Uber and we were going down the street. He pulled over the Uber, he told him to stop. And then he comes to the back window and he tells me, hey, what's up, man? Um, how you doing? I was like, what do you, I was like, what? And the Uber driver's even like, what's that about? I go, I have no idea. And he goes, wow, that was like straight racial profiling. He goes, that's crazy. Did you get stopped when you're driving? Yeah. How, how often does that happen? Probably like maybe once a month or once every other month. But police bias against communities of color has long been a problem nationwide, including in the country's largest police department, the NYPD. We have the lowest murder rate of any city in America. New York's police commissioner, Ray Kelly, defends what's called the stop and frisk policy, which allows officers to detain anyone who they find suspicious. In 2011, at the height of the stop and frisk program, black people were almost six times more likely to be stopped and frisked than white people. But now, police are starting to harness new tools some departments say keep streets safe by just following the hard data. About 13 miles east of Los Angeles, the El Monte Police Department has outfitted its patrol cars with a highly targeted artificial intelligence-driven tool for fighting crime. We are on Valley Mall, which is a, an older uh, commercial area. Um, a lot of pedestrian traffic, there's vehicles, so there's a lot of opportunities for property crimes and thefts. The program is called PredPol, short for Predictive Policing. It uses an algorithm that sifts through historical property crime data to find a pattern that points police to the location where the next crime is likely to be committed. Valley Mall will often make it on PredPol as an address in particular because there are so many businesses and when you have crimes occurring in one area, that's going to produce that you should spend more time and that's more chances that they're going to deter something before it turns into a crime. What is the aim of this PredPol software? Ultimately is, is to help just reduce and prevent crime. Is there a quantifiable measure of of its success. The last 19 months, crime has been reduced well over 20% in the city. That's after a couple years of a spike. So the last two years, over 20%. That's a success. And yes, I, I have to say predictive policing, PredPol is part of that success. I mean, on some levels it makes 
perfect sense. You send your assets to where the data tells you that they're, that they're most needed. But by nature, the data sets that Predpool is, is feeding off of and generating its conclusions from are inherently biased because of, of biased policing over the years. With Predpool though, we are looking and we're targeting crime. Uh, we're not biased towards any certain group of people. But really, we're taking out the, the human factor with Predpool is that there is none. We're not profiling people, but rather profiling crime. So this all sounds very, very promising with, with the stated goal of stopping crimes, preventing crimes from, from ever taking place. Uh, are predictive policing programs effectively doing that? And the idea that we can identify using past crime data where a crime will occur in the future. We don't know if that works. We just don't have data on it. But what we've seen in the first iterations of some of these technologies hasn't been a whole lot of foresight, hasn't been a whole lot of thought about what are the inputs we need to choose in order to be able to use and get outputs we want that won't be colored by the problems we know are inherent in lots of uh, policing, especially urban policing. The LAPD is one of the pioneers when it comes to policing, particularly the use of technology. Where have they stood when it comes to the deployment and development of predictive policing? So LAPD was the place where predictive policing was born. Chief Braddon, when he went to LA, was the person who put the green light on the first attempts at place-based predictive policing using Predpol. They also helped pioneer a person-based predictive policing program called LASER. <laughs> There was Jim Crow, segregation, broken windows, Comstat, and now we are in the era of data-driven, precision-based policing. Yet it still remains the same, the banishment of black and brown and poor people. In contrast to location-based Predpol, Laser targeted individuals most likely to commit a crime by assigning them points based on their personal criminal histories like gang membership, arrests, and so-called quality interactions with police. Individuals with sufficient points are then assigned a chronic offender's bulletin, similar to a most wanted poster, and those bulletins are disseminated to officers. Do you know that LAPD has a secret list of people that they track and they trace? Since 2011, the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition has been fighting against the program filing public records requests, and alerting the public to what they say are biases built into the system. There's a list, mm -hmm. there's a bulletin of people who are by name targeted by the police. Yes, every field interview card that gets filled out on you, you get a point. So the more often you're stopped by law enforcement and they fill out a field interview card on you, the more points you get. But when we look at stops, in 2017, the black community was stopped five times more than the white community. That's who's getting the points. So, so once you're on the list, you're not getting off the list. Well, they claim you can get off the list if you don't have interactions with law enforcement. But if, if the instructions to law enforcement is to find you, follow you, stop you, violate you, how are you ever going to get off the list? It's, you're caught mm -hmm. up in a feedback loop. Yeah, and that's a very big implication to have your name and your picture, where you live, who you hang out with, what you do, what kind of car you drive to be in the hands of a line officer who now has you targeted as a person of interest. So the laser program was designed on the metaphor that they were going to, like laser surgery, remove 